There used to be a TV show in the 90s, which again is probably before your guys' time, that was called The Magic School Bus. And basically what it features is a school teacher, Mrs. Frizzle, who takes kids in a school bus that can go and like shrink itself to atomic dimensions and then you can see what's going on oh. atoms or fly out into the universe and you can see what's going on with neutron stars and you know, whatever. Mm. And so they would have an adventure like that every week. So it was kind of like a science. And, and she would tell the kids in pretty much every episode, you know, just make mistakes, right? And that actually is the, the key. So you need to just make mistakes and you need to be patient. Welcome to the UIUC Talk Show. Our goal of this show is to introduce you to the most interesting people with the most interesting ideas. Today we're talking to Dr. Martin, the honey hanger, honey badger, honey badger, honey badger yeah, yeah. Uh, Groovel. Welcome. All right. Thanks, guys, for having me here. Yeah, let's let's hear the questions. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to start with. So you came from Germany and then uh -huh. you did your undergrad in, in Berkeley. That's but right. I'm wondering, how, like, what did you grow up doing that led you to what you're doing now? Who were you as a kid? Is there anything you miss about Germany? Yeah, so, um, so I, I actually didn't grow up in Germany ever. Okay. <laughs> I left, well, that's not quite true. For five years I did. And, you know, and then my family moved to uh, 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 Vienna, Austria. And then they moved to um, Spain, to Malaga, and then from there to the U.S. Wow. Uh, it was really, my father had a construction financing company, and so there were big projects that took years and years to build, like hotels and stuff mm. like that. So it was kind of like the, the military children, except it was the construction right. <laughs> children. So, so I went to a French school as a, as a uh, like elementary school, middle school student, and then a Spanish school as a high school student, and then finally in the U.S. I went as a high school student to an American school. I was 16, though, when I came here, so I still have an, a German accent. It didn't quite go away. My brother's four years younger. You wouldn't be able to tell he's not a Native American. You know, Twelve years, that's young enough that you know, no more accent at that sure. age. And, uh, uh, well, as far as what I do or what I, you know, how I got into it, um, I wanted to be a scientist, actually, since I was a young child. You know, some people, it hits them in high school or sometimes even yeah. college. But uh, I, I was interested in that you know, since I was like five or six. And, and in fact, you know, children don't have that many memories from when they're like five years old. But I have this one memory of my father mowing the lawn in Austria. He did it only twice a year, so he usually let the grass go about to here. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and then the gas ran out. And so I asked him, so what do you mix with water to make gasoline? Because, you know, I was five years old, and to me, you know, I knew orange juice is water with orange pulp in it, and coffee is water with <laughs> some black, t not very tasty stuff in it, and, you know, milk is water with white stuff in it. So I figured, you know, gasoline must be water with, you know, something. Right. He said, there is no water in gasoline. My jaw dropped. <laughs> and I'm like, what? So what is it? It's like things can be liquids and they don't have to have uh, water. water in them, right? And so I, I, I asked him, like, who figures that out? And he says, well, like chemists or physicists. And so I said, that's what I want to do. And so a couple of years later, I had a chemistry lab. Um, back in those days in Austria, it was very different from now. Like the world is very secure now. Yeah, your moms are watching you on cell phones and whatever. Your friends text you every 20 seconds. So none of the stuff existed. Right? There were no cell phones. There was no nothing. Um, so I would, as a nine-year-old in Vienna, I'd walk into a chemistry supply store on campus at the university in downtown Vienna and ask for like concentrated sulfuric acid and, <laughs> and uh, you know, glycerol and whatever. And they're just like, sure, yeah, you know, <laughs> handed it to me. That wouldn't happen here. I don't think a nine-year-old could walk into any chemical supply right. store and buy With the uh, raising eyebrows. Especially if they asked for like concentrated acid and glycerol, people would start thinking, hmm. And, and nitric acid as well, like, yeah. <laughs> okay, what are you trying to make? <laughs> uh, because, you know, at a certain age, you're only interested in blowing stuff up. So right. that's, that's what I did. Um, and, but eventually, you know, my family ended up moving to Spain and then to uh, the United States. And so that's how I ended up in, in the U.S. But at that point, I really already wanted to do science. I got sidetracked into computer science almost uh, for a bit. Um, so back in, so I, I left Spain in 1979. We got here in, in early 1980. And the personal computer revolution just started. So you could buy something called an Apple II, <laughs> mm. uh, which had 40 kilobytes of RAM. <laughs> and it didn't have a hard drive, but it, you could record uh, data on a tape recorder instead. Uh, 
it was actually interesting to listen to because you know it encoded the bits of course as some kind of a, two different kinds of blips right. and so you listen to it and it you know it sounded like a modem but that doesn't tell anybody nowadays anything yeah, yeah, yeah. in either anymore <laughs> but you know it made that kind of a sound but anyway so i learned computer programming on that and and back then if you want things to run fast you had to program in machine language that was all directly in the in the, in, in the machine language and uh, i really enjoyed it a lot i actually wrote probably one of the earliest 3d computer games um, so the, the Apple actually was f uh, not that fast. It took about a second to calculate a sine or a cosine function, which normally you would need to do the trigonometry to mm -hmm. rotate things, right, for 3D. And so I scratched my head and I actually figured out a very simple algorithm that made use of the processor's capabilities. It was a 6502 chip. And it couldn't even do multiply. So that was, it had addition, subtraction, and it had shift left, shift right. So you could take the 8-bit register and shift it left or right, which is divide or multiply by 2. Okay? And so I actually figured out an algorithm to approximate rotations um, by just using addition and shifting uh, in binary. And uh, so I wrote a computer game where you could go through, a, it was one of those like personal, you know, you, know, you could go through a corridor and turn left right. and right. And, uh, and, uh, uh, I should have maybe I should have stuck with it. I think it's a more lucrative business <laughs> than the one I ended up uh, in in the end. But uh, uh, and my brother, by the way, helped me with this. Um, so uh, because you had to code everything in uh, hexadecimal, that was like the highest level. So you didn't have to at least do the binary strings. You could do right, right. hexadecimal. Um, but I was too lazy even for that, and I just coded in terms of the machine language command abbreviations, which nowadays you would have an assembler, which nobody uses anymore. Mm. Right? Um, and now we have, you know, better stuff you know, to work with. Uh, but uh, uh, and so my brother got trained that I would tell him the commands like mux, you know, ASL, you know, and, you know, and so forth, you know, and uh, you know the register, and he would turn that into the hexadecimal code. So he was like sitting next to me, and actually write the raw uh, machine code, and then I would test the programs and make sure that they were working. And he became a computer scientist. So mm. <laughs> uh, he did very well at it too. His, I think his company had an initial public offering uh, oh, wow. like three years or so in. And he was one of the first five people or something like that hired by it. So you know, he made out very well <laughs> with that. So we do have computer science in the family, just not me. And uh, you know, I still do computational work even now. You know, we do a lot of uh, uh, computer simulation, computer simulated dynamics. But uh, uh, you know, I, but I'm dedicating it to biology and chemistry and physics as mm. opposed to you know, computer science. So I got out of it, and my brother really got into it. Uh, and, and But then I studied chemistry when I got to university. So. Which company? Um, the company was called, so it doesn't it exist any longer, because it was bought up then right. by an even bigger company. It was called Heuristic Physics Laboratories. And they were a company like, if you maybe people here know, there's these companies like uh, LAM Works or KLA and they make semiconductor testing equipment. So they're mm. not actually making the chips or the memory or, or that sort of stuff, but they make equipment to actually test right. for defects and, and mm. things of that sort. So Heuristic Physics Labs was one of those companies in the uh, early 90s, and they were eventually bought out. But I don't know. They, so they probably are part of LAM or KLA right now. Right. I don't know which. You mentioned the Apple II. Is this mm -hmm. what inspired your look? Mm -hmm. Following? Um, the creator? Uh, no, no. So he wasn't actually. I was wearing this long before Steve Jobs. Really? Uh, did, yeah. Steve Jobs only got into this because it became like Euro tech savvy in the 1980s to wear like black, you know, pullovers and, and gray pants. This is actually what I call like German art wear. Hmm. And so in Germany, people were wearing this in the 1960s. Oh, this very common there? 70s. Oh, it's totally common mm. there, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't, here you kind of notice it a little bit. In Germany, you wouldn't even notice if you walked around the streets of right. Frankfurt or whatever. It's like, you know, plenty of people that are hmm. dressed like this. Now, J Steve Jobs was wearing hippie clothing in the 70s and early 80s. But right. Eventually, he decided to go for the more you know, industrial designer look, I guess. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, people also sometimes t tell me that I look like this guy on what's that show, uh, Sheldon Brown or something like that. Uh, um, the show about that Caltech physicist. Uh, oh, Big Bang it? Theory. Big Bang Theory. Yeah, I don't know. If Sheldon Cooper. Enough. Sheldon Cooper. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Sheldon Brown is somebody else that's actually a bicycling <laughs> uh, guy. And and uh, and I tell him no. He, if anything, he looks like me because I'm quite a bit older. So I was. First. <laughs> anyway, all right. Yeah, so since a very early age, you, you show this science of deep curiosity. Like you, when you were going to Vienna and going to this, buying this, this chemicals, and then when you were in high school, you were playing mm -hmm. around with this computer. So like whatever you, you were doing, you were 
doing great stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you think that allow you to do those type of things? Because that's not necessarily a you know quote unquote normal thing, right? So, so what do you think? Okay, happened? so I'm going to dispute that and actually okay. say that is normal in children. I mean, if you look at uh, try, remember, I mean, you guys are exploratory as well, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing this. Uh, and uh, but if you think back at you know like all the kids you knew. That's what kids do. They like to run around and try weird stuff, and you know they're not really worried about whether something is new or not. And I think what happens is that uh, some people ha have the luxury of maintaining this <laughs> into their older life, and and other people don't have the luxury. It's often not even that they wouldn't do it, or but you know you get a job and it's kind of more of a day job that you've got to do as, as opposed to something that's fun, right? And and then you kind of sink into this uh, you know thing where you just you know. You have that life where you do that, and you get home, and you're tired, and you know, whatever. And so that can take creativity away in the end. But I actually think uh, this, you know, creativity and just playing around with different stuff is very natural for most people, certainly when they're young. And then I think it kind of gets driven out of us <laughs> mm -hmm. with the daily rat race or whatever you want to right. call it. Um, but I think people have that capacity, and people can revive that capacity if they want to. Uh, like often, right? People go like, "Oh, I should do this, but I don't have the time right now." So that's so I, I do the opposite. I say, "Oh, I should do this. Forget the other thing. I'm doing this." Yeah. <laughs> this is you know, <clears throat> and I think just maintaining that attitude. Um, so I guess some people would say I have a short attention span, therefore, right? Because it's pretty easy to distract me and get to do something else. Like Suzanne that I mentioned, right? You just ask her like, "Hey, do you want to do a 250 mile bike ride in Iowa?" And it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even if she had something else probably planned. Uh, so I think some people just have that attitude and, and, uh, and some people sort of lose it eventually. But, but uh, I think most people actually can do that mm. if, they, if they want to. But you have to kind of, as you get older, you have to maybe spend a little bit more time wanting to do it because there's so many other obligations and things that come into your life that, that could easily distract from being distracted. Hmm. Yeah, and no, I think I think it's true. It, it just for some reason, when, once you get a little older, it just takes a lot more effort. And I think there's something very beautiful about okay, I want to do this project, and like I'm I'm gonna do it. So like yesterday, I mean not yesterday, last week, last Friday, we spent the whole day coding, mm -hmm. uh, taking images from the uh, James Webb Telescope mm -hmm. and making a website. Mm -hmm. Why? It's just cool, right? Just for fun, but yeah, because yeah, they're yeah. cool images, so let's yeah. show them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it for some reason like it. There's like this notion of like, oh, like you have a short attention span, like, oh, you're not being very focused, you're not being very diligent. And it just, for some reason, like being curious and trying different things, you be, it becomes a bad sign. Uh, it becomes a bad quality of a person. That's right. So I think sometimes our society almost treats this like something that's like, as you said, it's not normal. But I think it is actually normal and it's driven out of people in the end. And it's understandable, right? Because you have work to do, you have a family, and, and these are all important things that you right. need to devote time to. So it's very easy then to have a list of you know, just I need to do this, 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 and this, and then there's just no time left at the end. And honestly, actually, the only way that I can deal with it is literally scheduling. So I, I, these days I have to schedule like that I'm gonna not do anything. <laughs> so I have like blocks of time free on my calendar. And you know, if somebody tells me, well, can we have a committee meeting? It's like, nope, can't, I'm busy, even though I'm gonna do something. You know, uh, interesting <laughs> planning at, at that time because you could always say oh I'm gonna cancel that right because do I need to go on that bike ride or do they need to make that website and the answer is no I don't need to right now so I could just say yes right and so you have to just learn to actually say no and you know and you still end up doing plenty of useful stuff that works you know, in the community and, and helps with all the other things that you're uh, dealing with but you need to leave that time to just do stuff for yourself that's fun and interesting and that you want to do randomly or because friend some friend asks you and things like that so um, yeah so you were doing computer science and making programs and you were actually pretty good at it because you you created this really oh yeah i've written things. hundreds of thousands of lines of code you know, so I, now of course i'm getting too old to do the like 48 hour coding marathon but you know <laughs> when i was like in my 20s no problem <laughs> i would stay up for that long <laughs> at the computer screen so and you were always pretty good at it and for some reason you decided to go with chemistry yeah so what happened in your mind, and, and, and just walk us through the, like yeah. The well, no, honestly, no, it was chemistry all along, right? Because as I said, you know, right, that's, right. that was right. the five-year-old experience, and but then I, there was temporary the possibility of getting sidetracked because mm. I my my dad actually also gave me a, a Hewlett Packard programmable calculator in 1978, which was the hottest thing since sliced bread in the day, 
uh, it actually was a calculator that had a magnetic card slot, so it could actually save programs data. and data, but also programs mm. actually. And you could actually buy keystrokes on the calculator, you could actually program it to repeat the keystrokes. And it had actually keys for decision statements, mm. like if statements or loops or wow. things of that sort. Uh, and but it only had 200 lines of code. And that's all it could do. But still, actually, in 1978, you could actually get a computer in your hand. The calculator was only about this big, but it wasn't mm. you know, very large. With ma with storage, a storage device, you know, like a, the mini version of a hard drive. Mm. You know, just about it was about the size of a finger, basically. Um, and so that's what I started with, and I got kind of intrigued. Uh, I think the most sophisticated program I wrote at the time was playing Battleship against the computer. You know that old game where you have to like. A5, and then you know, either there is a U boat there or not, and you know, you, so you sink it. And so I, and then, so I wrote an algorithm where the computer would actually not completely stupid. It would figure out that you know, if if uh, it got a hit on you, that you search the pixels around that mm. right for the next one, uh, and, and so forth down the line. Uh, so it was actually fairly hard to beat. <laughs> uh, it was at least as good as other kids at, you know, at at playing the game. And so then I got this Apple computer and got even more into it. But you know, in the end, it, it, as fascinating as I wa as it was. I finally thought, you know, I love this, but actually I love chemistry even more. And, and so, you know, I can do computation in chemistry as well. And so I ended up doing that as opposed to my brother who actually became, you know, he got a computer science uh, bachelor's degree at uh, University of Santa Clara. And that's what he did. He's, he's a professional computer scientist. I think the thing that stands out the most to me from your story um, that you mentioned is that you kept finding resources as you grew up to pursue your mm -hmm. interests, right? Because I think a very important part which um, which people might forget is the teachers that you had, right? Mm -hmm. Like if they, if you enjoyed learning the subject, that's what made you continue doing it, right? right? So the importance of having a good teacher that's right. plays a very big role in, in anyone's interest in a particular right. subject, right? That's and right. being in a college like this, you, you don't really have a control on who teaches you what, right? Because the professors change. Yeah, and it's a matter of luck. Right, right. It's, it is a matter of luck. So how, how have you realized that importance of having good teachers and being where you are right now? Oh, yeah. No, I, I, that, that really, really is important to keep up motivation. And I got lucky. I mean, of course, we all have our share of good teachers and bad right. teachers, right? But so, for example, uh, in, in uh, high school in Spain, uh, I really was thinking of chemistry more as synthesis, so you like make molecules. And that's still one of the largest parts of chemistry, a very important one. Uh, but I had a really, really good physics teacher, hmm. and I never really thought that much about physics before, and, uh, and had him for two years. And uh, you know, I got to talking about him, and he actually realized that, hey, this guy seems to have some mathematical aptitude. So I actually started studying quantum mechanics and things like this with this guy in, in, in school. And he brought his university textbooks in. For <laughs> to, but you know, again, not any high school teacher is necessarily going to do that. But, right. uh, but this guy uh, did it. And so I enjoyed that a lot. And that actually was one of the things that veered me over from uh, more like the synthesis side of chemistry towards the physics side of chemistry, which is still what I do now. Right? Mm. It's more on the, what we call physical chemistry is the name of the sort of area within uh, chemistry. And you know, I came to the US a couple of years later as when, we, when my parents moved from uh, uh, Malaga to San Francisco. And I had a really good calculus teacher mm. <laughs> there. And uh, she was very strict, of course, like, like many calculus teachers are. I, I, uh, my favorite story from that is, uh, so in Germany, when you write numbers, the digit one actually kind of looks like, almost like an A, but without the bar through it. You just go up and then you go down. Mm. Whereas in the US, it's just down. And so, you know, I would do these calculations on the exams or in homework, and the answer might be something like, uh, 1,123, and I would write you know, 123, and she would give me zero on and say, you said 7723, seven, you know. and I said, no, that's no, obviously one. You can see my seven has a bar in the middle through it. Mm -hmm. So it, she said, no, you know, in the US, you, you put so it's zero. <laughs> 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 so very quickly, obviously, I got convinced to uh, switch over from, <laughs> 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 from the European one to the vertical bar uh, one, since I did want to get good scores on mm -hmm. the uh, on the exams, uh, and that worked out you know, perfectly well in the end. She was actually very good. You know, that sort of made me a little grumpy, but it turns out she was actually very good. And, and also, again, had that attitude of, you know, if a student is interested in going beyond the classroom, then you can give them extra stuff you know, to work on. And so that was this case again there with, with uh, mathematics. In fact, I was a, a minor in mathematics at Berkeley. Oh. Um, but uh, 
Uh, and I was even debating at some point, and this is so interesting, maybe I should you know, even switch over into that. Um, but actually, then I got to know real mathematicians. Yeah. And these guys are so much better <laughs> at it than, than, uh, than I am or was even back then, right? Uh, that I thought, forget it. You know? <laughs> I mean, these people are like really apt at it. And uh, you know, that's when you sort of realize there are actually different ranges of aptitude for different kinds of things. And there's, of course, always improvements that you can get through learning. But there's also something like natural talent. Natural, you know? yeah. It's not just a question of, you know, you can become a professional mathematician just because you say you're going to right. do that. Right? That's, that's not the, uh, you know, good enough. And uh, that was actually one of those places where I realized that, that you know, different people have different aptitudes. And, and of course, you can learn almost anything up to some you know, extent. But then if you want to be in that 99.9999% where you need to do, be to do research, right, then mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you can't necessarily you know, have that natural facility. And so I, so I just stuck with the math minor <laughs> and, 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 and again, stayed with physical chemistry. Um, because physical chemistry also requires a certain um, aptitude for experiments and designing experiments and how do you make things work when you don't seem to have like even the right kinds of materials that mm. you know, need to build up an experiment and do something. And I was very good at that. Uh, and so that came in you know, very handy. And that's why I also decided to pursue you know, grad school in chemistry. So a, a question that comes through a lot of people, especially people who are in college, mm -hmm. is that how do I know what things I'm actually good at? Mm -hmm. And you said that you were an undergrad at Berkeley and then like you saw people around and you got to know the, the mathematicians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are a lot better. But how, do you, how can you actually know what your aptitudes are and from your career, like what have you learned? Yeah from the, seeing different people and how to identify right. that aptitude. Yeah, so I mean, it gets us back actually to this theme of that kids are willing to try anything, right? That's how I learned it, right? I was, I tried everything and I found like, hey, computer program, yeah, I'm good at that one. Chemistry, yes, my experiments make good yields and they usually work, right? So you have like the finger tip feeling. Math, I'm good at, but not that I'm going to be a professional mathematician, right? That can derive novel theorems and, and, and do things like this. It's same in sports, right? I mean. <clears throat> One of the reasons I do ultra endurance sports is because, needless to say, I'm good at it. I tried lots of other sports, and I found out even as a teenager already that uh, my rapid hand eye coordination is just no good. Uh, and and the way I knew this is my brother is four years younger than than I am. So like when I was 12, he was eight, and and we would do all kinds of things like anything from uh, 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 playing golf to tennis to playing video games or stuff mm -hmm. like that, and my eight-year-old brother beat me at golf, <laughs> tennis, and video games. And you know, at the four age, the, 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 there's a four-year developmental difference there. So if you're a 12-year-old and you can't beat an eight-year-old <laughs> at, at golf, let's say, maybe they have, you know, maybe they're better at it. And we were certainly both tried, right? We both made an effort. We got a teacher and really tried to learn it. And, and he ended up just being much better hmm. at it than was. So I, so I realized that you know, there's just things. And it's not that I could play golf, right? But, but, but he was just... You know, better at it. And so you can certainly teach yourself to learn things and you can learn from other things and you can observe other people. But I think in the end, the only solution is you've got to just try out stuff. And then you have to be realistic. And, and uh, uh, you know, I think there's a mantra in like these old US Army ads where they, they said, be all that you can be. I, I maybe even remember that, but like a, their mantra in the ads in the 1990s or something like that. But it wasn't you can be anything you want to be. It was be all you can be. Right? Mm. And so that's the difference here is that, uh, uh, you know, I decided and uh, other people make different decisions, but I decided I was going to figure out like the things that I'm like really good at and the things I'm sort of pretty good at and the things I'm like, not so good at, like say playing tennis. And, uh, and my mother gave me that advice. I actually, it's, again, it's one of those memories. Maybe I was eight or nine or something like that. Uh, and she told me, uh, you know, figure out what you're the best at and do that for a job and then figure out what you're the next best at and then you can do that as a hobby. And that was kind of like the attitude of, okay, you know, you know, I think I know where my bread is, is buttered. And so I tried all kinds of stuff um, and figured out that it was, some of them were easier you know, to do and came more easily and I learned them faster. And some of them were harder to do and I had to kind of pull nails right, uh, to learn it. And so that's basically how I settled in on doing the things that I do, both you know, in my free time as well as you know, for work. Do you think that intuition is innate, though? 
I don't know. I mean, like most trades, my guess would be that some people are better at it than others, right? Some people probably have a tougher time figuring out what they're really good at, and they will have to then work on it. And for others, it probably comes more naturally. But I would actually make the argument that if you think that figuring out what you're good at is one of the things that you're not so good at, that one is probably worth spending the extra effort and time <laughs> doing, right? I wouldn't say it's worth spending a lot of effort doing things that you have figured out already you're not that, mm. you know, that good at. But, but, uh, but that would be one <laughs> that, that would be worth it. And, you know, so it takes a certain degree of self-knowledge. And, of course, as you get older, you also have more experience. You have known more people in your life. Then it's easier to do those things. When you're really young, you don't have that experience, and so it's harder. And I think that's often a problem for people, right, is that you have to make those decisions when you're very young, uh, and, but you would have maybe made them better <laughs> if you had been older. Like, one of the things I love about the U.S. school system is it's very relaxed and, and sort of allows quite a bit of freedom. Like, in the old German school system, when I was still in Germany, now they have also relaxed it somewhat. Um, it was actually a situation where at age 14 you had to decide uh, whether you, you know, uh, would finish up at age 14 or age 16 or age 19 with school, and that would determine whether you could even go to a science university or whether you would become a carpenter or something like that. Right? And in my experience from people that I know and, and even you know, knowing myself, there are a lot of people out there when they're 16 or 17, they really, <laughs> they're goofing off or they don't know what they're supposed to do yet. and so. If you're telling somebody at that age already, like you can't do that anymore, right? You're probably taking people that could actually do really well, mm. uh, and and then you're kind of shutting them off from being able to even find out whether they could or not. So that was one of the things that I really liked about the U.S. school system that it's very sort of mixed up and integrated, um, uh, as opposed to the very stratified school system that existed in Germany at the time in the 1970s and probably still into the 1980s. Um, so. You know, all I can say is it's never too late. Uh, if you start thinking, if you have a job or you do something and you start thinking like, uh, I don't really want to come in and do this, you should actually <laughs> think yeah. about doing something else. Even though I know there's a barrier to doing it, mm. it's kind of scary because you're getting paid already to do this. And so, you know, it's kind of uh, scary. But you're going to do it many times anyway. Like people who go into industry, I think they change jobs multiple times in their careers. And so you, know, you might as well face it and do it. Yeah, instead of waiting. I think that exactly. there's a, on Tuesday, we, we, we were talking to um, Gene Robinson. Mm -hmm. we, he, you know, he has this idea of like mm -hmm. nurture versus nature. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were talking about this idea that um, it's, uh, it's really important to figure out new ways to mm -hmm. let more people try different mm -hmm. things. Like the school system is, is a good way to mm -hmm. do that, like to mm -hmm. let people to try different things. Mm -hmm. But it seems to be not good enough because when people get to, let's say, college, they are what 17 18 and mm -hmm. they, they need to some pick, uh, you know figure something out but if you haven't mm -hmm. tried enough things you just pick something at random and you and you, you end up here and then you realize like the first year you don't like what you're doing and then it's too late because then you're behind and then right. it's just like yeah and so that's the key because right? so you have to get out of this attitude that you're behind right i mean in the worst case scenario first of all in your first year or even in your second year of college even if you did declare a major or something like that there is ample opportunity to still change. I mean, a lot of the classes you take at the beginning, that's true actually even in graduate school, but it's certainly even more true even at the undergrad level, they are pretty generalist classes, right? You're taking like English requirements and, and literature requirements and history requirements and things like this. And of course, in addition, you might take introductory computer science or science or other kinds of courses or arts courses or whatever you know, your, wherever your interests lie. And, and you might figure out after a, you know, a year that like, no, I, I like this other thing maybe better. Um, and it's really not too late. I mean, you can, you know, what's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario might be that you do take like four and a half years to graduate. But you're actually, I think you'd be better off doing that than, than kind of sticking with something. I did that, by the way, as a student. So, uh, you know, my parents uh, uh, thought that, that chemistry is not like a profession where you can actually make any kind of money or survive, which is actually not true. You can do quite well <laughs> as a chemist. And so they wanted me to become a... Uh, uh, dentist or a, or a, um, a med, you know, a medical professional of some kind. And uh, so I went to Berkeley and, and I actually was a biochemistry major oh. for a semester. And, and I took the biochemistry class and I just didn't really like it. I actually love biochemistry now. And a lot of my research is actually biological research, but I did not like what was being done back then, which is memorizing huge schemes of mm. reaction cycles and, and things like that. And so I actually just 
uh, can't, left the class halfway through the semester and, and, and jumped into a physics class instead and just did that. And okay, so I did it pretty quickly. And of course, there was in my case some parental pressure, which was the reason why in the first place I wasn't doing the thing mm. uh, that I thought might be the best you know, th thing for me to do. And so I switched majors actually twice because I switched from biochemistry into chemistry and they had two chemistry majors, kind of like here. We actually have an LAS and a sort of professional yeah. you know, chemistry major. So I switched into that LAS one first and then I switched into the, you mm. know, uh, uh, the whatever professional major because by then it was you know again I was back on my course of I'm going to grad school and, and doing research um, so it's never too late you know uh, to, to change I mean people sometimes change much later people graduate from college and then do stuff for a while and realize that that's not really like what they really want to do and then maybe even go back to school again or, or just change you know professions of course it becomes harder at some point <coughs> if you're employed in industry and you're making a nice salary, and perhaps you even have a young family at that point, it's much harder to go at, oh, I'm gonna to go to grad school, <laughs> and back to that minuscule grad school salary again, but, but uh, so. Do you think the way you were taught played a role in why you didn't like biochemistry? No, no, not, I had actually no, ex I thought even like, hey, this sounds pretty interesting, let's try it out, right? And, but I really did not like the way that that class was taught. I yeah, don't exactly. think they teach biochemistry right away that way anymore. But this is this was like 1982. But this was a purely memorization class. And uh, uh, and by the way, nothing against that either. I mean, again, uh, my strength is not in that. Right? My strength is I, I can you can give me an equation like the Schrodinger equation, and I can sit down and derive the Gibbs free energy relationship from that on the, with my pencil and paper, right? Because I can sort of follow through the logic. Um, other people are really good actually at remembering very large numbers of connected facts. And it's not the facts that are important, it's actually those interconnections. Connections. And then having a picture out of that, that's not like equations, but it is actually a sort of fairly well logically built a picture. But to do that, you do have to have that ability to store also these facts that mm. are then interconnected. And I find that actually a lot of scientists uh, and, and uh, fall into the kind of the, you know, you can sort of say some are more on the interconnect the facts and come up with schemata that way. And some are more like go through equations and explain things by yeah. sort of connecting things and that way. And I simply found that I was more of the second kind and that biochemistry class was totally geared towards the first kind. And so it was really just not for me. So do you think the, the, the only reliable metric is your own intuition or like your yeah, own? In the like end, you have to experience it to know it. When I, when I t as I said, when I took this class, I thought like, why not? You know, uh, we'll see, you know, maybe I'll do that mm -hmm. you know, after all. And, and, but I took it and it really just was not to my liking. And I, I, I got out of the class and took something else instead. And, and you know, my parents eventually forgave me <laughs> for becoming a chemist. I think they eventually actually realized, oh, actually it's not that bad. There's jobs out there. And, you know, the life of a university professor is not so bad. Mm. You know, all of that. Well, 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 yeah, go ahead. Yeah. What were the setbacks that you faced just because of that dissonance? Well, I mean, so there are, of course, you know, setbacks that you encounter you know, because of things like this. I mean, in the case of my parents, we didn't talk for years right and it was that wasn't easy and you know your parents are people that you usually you know, are you know pretty close to and uh, and so that took a few years uh, until they saw that like okay he did graduate he got a phd he's getting you know uh, um, uh, you know a, a good employment and uh, so you know you have to work through times like that mm -hmm. and especially when it's something that's related to your family then it's hard you know it's already bad enough if you lose a friend over something, but it's even worse if you're like you know, not talking to your parents over something. But you know, we all have networks of people that tell you like, no, no, what you're doing is, <laughs> is okay. And certainly <clears throat> my siblings were like, yeah, you're good with, with what you're doing. Uh, yeah, my parents did like the idea of my brother doing computer science. That was sort of like, yeah, we can understand how you get employed with that. Uh, they didn't like my sisters. Uh, I think either she she actually became a biologist, so and that wasn't really you know, to their liking either. But eventually, we all you know I think we reconciled, and I think they they understood that yeah you know, these choices weren't that bad actually that the the kids made. Uh, so it was a few years of rough going in the family, but eventually it settled down. I guess the important part is that you didn't lose that confidence in yourself and. Yeah, and, so, and you might. Right? I mean, you know, there is certainly something about peer pressure and parental peer exactly. pressure is worse probably yeah. than, than uh, most peer pressure. But I think a lot of us experience that because, mm. 
you know, our parents have ideas about what they would we should their, be yeah. and what we want, uh, what they want us to do. And often those ideas don't go s far away from the, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree kind mm -hmm. of ideas. Uh, but you want to do something different. And, uh, you know, in the end, you have to listen to yourself. I mean, for me, it was just so clear that mm -hmm. this was stuff that I don't like to study that much. And this is stuff that I really do like to mm -hmm. study or the way it wasn't even, as I said, it's not even this is the stuff that I like to study. I do biophysics now and bio, you know, I do this uh, for a living. But it, it was the way that it, I would have to study. I just didn't like that. And so I did something different. Um, so yeah, I, I think in the end, you have to give yourself the benefit of the doubt that if you really feel you like something and you really feel you don't like something else, even if there are some people in your life, even important ones that like disagree, you do the thing that you think you like to do. I think that's that's very important. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's 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 like you, you, you would rather have the fight with your parents early on then let's say that you ended up becoming a biochemist yeah. and then you become a dentist and then you ended up hating your life yeah exactly and like never talking to them ever right. again and, and look my problem was a pretty small one i mean i yeah. had i had i had friends in late middle school like in ninth grade or tenth grade they really were not interested in the science classes and they weren't interested in, in you know the math class or any of these other things but they were jamming in a band and that's what they wanted to do right and so this is an you know then the problem arises even when you're like a teenager and you're 60 years old not not you know by the time you go to college and uh, but it was very clear that they were not going to be happy going to a university and sitting in classes and learning that kind of stuff. They wanted to make music and uh, and they did. <laughs> and again, it was the same situation. Uh, some of these I followed up with and I knew them years later. And, and it, the same thing happened. Right. I mean, their parents eventually settled into the idea that, well, you know, they seem to be able to survive. They're a musician. Why not? <laughs> uh, it just took them a while to come around, you know, to that to that idea. So, uh, so sometimes it could happen earlier. Sometimes it can happen later. Um, but I think you do have to listen, you know, especially if it's you know if it's something where you're like, well, I'm not sure one way or the other. Well, then maybe take the advice. Right? If somebody mm -hmm. says, even your parent, like maybe try this. You no, know, do it. And, uh, but if you can pretty definitely feel like I like this and I don't like this as much, then you really do need to listen to that and, and do what you like. Is there something that you wish you would have done differently? Yeah, you know, there's so. Sort of, um, I mean, there's a lot of times you come to these decision points where you have to decide what are you going to do, uh, and I had a bunch of these, um, but I think I made the right decisions in the end, and I think it's because what we talked about before, which is you try to sort of critically examine what is it that you're best at mm. and, and what is kind of like the second and third and whatever. But I mean, you know, for example. As a teenager, I was really into cartooning and comic strips. Hmm. And uh, that's actually a big, well, it's a big thing in the US, but it's actually also a big thing in Europe, although they have very different uh, strips. So in the US, everything seems to be geared towards superheroes for some reason. <laughs> like that's all comics are about, well, more about back then. I mean, we have, of course, more sophisticated graphic novels, <laughs> things like that. But in Europe, actually, comics like Asterix or, or Asterix, Tintin, yeah. uh, things oh, like that, you know, yeah. were actually, they were much more about like, Hey, here's a reporter having adventures or some guy fighting Romans or whatever. But right. they weren't. Uh, well, Asterix, I guess, was kind of a super, but not even really because right, he had right. to drink it's something. It's like Vikings. And yeah, the... yeah, exactly. It was kind of you know, that stuff. And so I really got into this and, and enjoyed this. And I was pretty good at uh, art. And so I actually wrote graphic novels. I have like literally 60 page long wow. full you know, graphic novels. I never sold them or did anything with them. They're just sitting in a drawer at home. Um, but I enjoyed doing that a lot. And at some point I was actually, you know, I, I, I even did uh, like strips, you know, comics, you know, strips for like a newspaper, a school newspaper. And I was thinking, you know, um, I had something called the Eggheads, which was like a short strip about eggs with legs. <laughs> mm. um, and I thought, you know, and I was reading the Sunday comics and newspapers, which that doesn't exist anymore. But back then, you know, the Sunday edition of the newspaper right. would have come. And I, and I looked at some of these and I thought like, I don't know, my thing is just about as good. I, I think I could write this. Um, but I finally actually made the decision not to do that, um, uh, even though I had an aptitude for it. And the reason was that I had the feeling that if I were to do this, I would eventually get locked into doing this like a chore almost. Like you have to deliver one of these every week, whether you have a good idea that week or not. And, and not only that, I mean, if you do this for years, there's like comic strips that have been around for like probably a hundred years. Well, maybe not quite a hundred years, but you know, like decade after decade. I figured if that happens to me eventually, I'll probably get bored of it or tired. Uh, but then I'm kind of locked in because there's an audience and they want that you know, to be done. This happened, by the way, to the author of Tintin. He went nuts in late life because 
there were expectations of what ta town books were supposed to look like, and he didn't want to fulfill them any longer. Um, whereas in science, I figured, you know, I'm never going to get bored because there's like new stuff. I, I might get bored of doing a certain subject because I think I figured out enough about it now and it's time to do some, investigate something else. But there's always something else that's mm. really different and it's very easy to go from one thing to another thing uh, in science. And so in the end, that had a great appeal to me. And then there were these other things, you know, like the, uh, uh, I think I would have done pretty well actually in computer science, but, but again, I, I, I don't feel too bad. Um, but there were uh, you know, other things where, where you know, uh, the decision was more obvious. Like I also like music a lot. I, I play pipe organ. I actually built a pipe organ that's sitting in my basement, um, although I don't have enough time to play on it mm. these days. Um, but uh, I was actually interested in, in music and at one point even considered you know, like becoming a pipe organist and composer would actually be kind of mm. ni neat. But then the same thing happened as with the mathematicians. I went to the School of Music and, and I got to meet real <laughs> pipe organ students and composers. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> these people are <laughs> so much faster. Like, I would actually write music, so I have composed music. Um, uh, but, but these people are so much more facile at it. I mean, it's almost effortless and they do mm. it. And I, I, I realized that, you know, again, you know, I'll never be at that level of being able to do it with that kind of ease. And so, whereas doing scientific research in chemistry and uh, related math and all those physical chemistry and the related math and all that, that really, there was a certain ease to it that I felt like, you know, this is natural to me. And that's why in the end I stuck with that. So, so no regrets. <laughs> hmm. I, I can relate with a lot of what you're saying because like even though I'm studying engineering, but there are a lot of other things which I mm -hmm. really enjoy doing mm -hmm. as well, like photography mm -hmm. or like playing the yeah. piano yeah, exactly. or like exactly. sketching, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, I, I used to do all of that as a kid, but as you grow up, like the, you need to prioritize some things. That's and then, right. right? That's as right. you mentioned, like you, you stop the habit of like playing because you don't get the time, right, That's as right. much. So. That's right. And I still play. Right. So I, I do it, right, but I play like an hour or two a week. Mm. And if you want to be really good at an instrument like pipe organ right. or piano or something like that, even as an amateur, actually, you have to play an hour a day or so. Mm -hmm. Professionals play you know, eight hours <laughs> a right. day you know, practicing right, to really maintain that, that, that facility. So I still do all these things. I mean, I sketch as well and, mm. and, and do all this, uh, these things that I sort of enjoy doing but at a much lower volume right? mm. uh, because in the end uh, you have to kind of concentrate on the things that you do best and that you want to really make progress with. And, and they do take time too, right? The scientific research takes time. Even like the ultra sports that I do because as I said, I'm not good at tennis, right? Yeah, so I went on to that side of things. It's a time investment. You actually have right. to spend time to be good at it, right? And that's one thing where I decided, yeah, I am going to spend the time mm. to be good at it. And other things I sort of did the... I'll do it for an hour a week because mm. I enjoy it, but and I'm not good at it anymore. Uh, and, but I don't care. Right? I'm mm. just doing it for fun anyway. Right? With the ultra racing, you are quite good at it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, before we get there, I, I, I am curious. So, someone looking from the uh, you are from the outside, you you can see that you do many things, and I'm wondering if you have a method uh, of learning. So, let's say that okay, so. You, you want to do research in this new area. So for, for instance, mm -hmm. let's say, mm -hmm. I mean, you've done research in like mRNA and, and quantum mechanics and things like that. So mm -hmm. like, let's say you want to do research with like mRNA, for instance, but mm -hmm. you know nothing about it. Mm -hmm. What's your method of, of jumping? Yeah. Like, like, what do you do? Like, what's your thought process? Yeah, yeah, no, so I have actually a method, which uh, I found out later on, apparently people at the National Science Foundation agree with this. As there used to be a TV show in the 90s, which again is probably before your guys' time, that was called The Magic School Bus. Uh, but maybe it's even still on, on television. And basically what it features is a school teacher, Mrs. Frizzle, who takes kids in a school bus that can go and like shrink itself to atomic dimensions and then you could see what's going on with uh. atoms or fly out into the universe and you could see what's going on with neutron stars and you know, whatever. Mm. And so they would have an adventure like that every week. So it was kind of like a science motivated like, kids. No, it wasn't science, it was science, not science fiction. It was all right, science, right. right? Except for the sh school bus uh, yeah, shrinking. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the rest of it was all focused on science. And, and she would tell the kids in pretty much every episode, you know, just make mistakes, right? And that actually is the, the key. So you need to just make mistakes and you need to be patient. And so in fact, I did research on, we do actually research on messenger RNA and on, on, on RNA in general. And I didn't know RNA from a hole in the ground uh, as a 
uh, even a fairly advanced faculty member already in the like early 2000s, right? I had been at the university already for like eight years or something like that. But I read some papers that looked very interesting to me. And I met up with some people at conferences that were RNA experts and knew what they were talking about. And so then eventually I came up with like a, an experiment that we could try and we did that and it didn't work and it was like garbage. But, but then we, you know, I figured out other experiments, right? Ideas are a dime a dozen, right? You can easily come up with, you know, uh, with more experiments. And then I figured out something that actually was interesting and worked. And I did a collaboration initially with an expert at Penn State University, Phil Bevilacqua, who knew a lot more about RNA. Uh, and, and we were patient. So that's the key. So we, if you get into something new, probably a lot of the stuff you're going to do is not going to be right. Actually, even if you, <laughs> often even for the old stuff, right? I mean, as a scientist, you kind of try stuff out and not every, most of the stuff doesn't work. Um, and then you just have to be patient rather than like, oh my God, the grant is running out in, in a year and I need to publish seven papers or else, whatever. So I never had that attitude. I always managed to turn that off. And that's hard for people to do. And so if something would take uh, several years before we even could get something, a reasonable first result, I would take that time. Uh, like we published some uh, paper uh, a year ago um, that took me since 1996 to get there, right? So that's wow. like 2021, 1996, so that's like uh, you know, 25, 25 you know, years, right? Uh, to really get to that dream that I thought I could do in, in 1996, I thought it would take me like a couple of <laughs> years, but it took more recently. Because it tried to like do, put all the bad things together, like super resolution at the sub nanometer level and time resolution at the femtosecond level and single molecules, like yeah. everything in one uh, experiment. Uh, and we finally did get it to work eventually. But there were literally five generations of graduate students over 25 years that worked on this. And they all did other, they, they did things, right? They got theses and published right. good stuff and so forth. But to get to that end goal, it took like 25 years. And if I had had the attitude of, oh my God, I need to do something for a, a grant, you know, uh, let, let's solve some problem of energy storage or whatever, whatever the hot thing of the day is, um, I wouldn't have gotten any of these things done. So I never had that. Uh, at that attitude, um, so patience, and and that means a little bit of courage because, you know, you can only afford patience if you have that courage because there's always demands, right? You need to publish, you need to get grant money, and da da da. And if you don't get something done, then you know the chances of that happening go down, and so you have to be willing to take those chances. But I've always found that you know, taking those chances was worth it. So you're going to make lots of mistakes. It's going to take time to figure out what you are really doing. And that just requires the patience until you, and you usually know. So in all of these things, I woke up at some point, some morning, and went like, it's clicked. Now I understand how we're going to model that RNA problem. And from now on, I think I actually know what's going on here and how, how to do this. And, and so you typically tend to know when you have that eureka moment. Mm. Um, yeah, and I think that's true with every, like when I was coding, you know, I usually knew like, okay, I'm on the right track See. here now and, and this is how I'm going to structure that program to do the thing that I want. So you usually have that moment and when you know, you know, uh, and, and, and then that's it. You don't need to be patient anymore. But up to that point, you're going to make lots of mistakes and you need to be patient. Well, when you know, you know. And I think that, that patience, is, it's, it's a virtue, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something that uh, for some reason, like maybe it's the sign of the times that uh, everyone, it's like you said earlier, everyone's just in a hurry and, and there's this, lack of uh, experimentation, lack of like, like this fear of making mistakes mm -hmm. and everyone just like trying to be perfect, trying to do all the right things to be, have the right life. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Especially it's something we see as you know, undergrads. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I'm curious, like what, uh, what's been on your mind and like, what are you excited? Like what topics uh, in, in science? Oh, lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but I'll just give you one or two random examples out of yeah. the science stuff that we do. So, uh, so one thing I've, I've been interested in for a long time which wasn't, again, our specialty at all, but we, I sort of got into it over the last few years, is the quantum measurement problem. Mm. So this is a big problem in quantum mechanics uh, where basically uh, there's something called the Born postulate that says that if a system is in a certain state, uh, then the, when you do a measurement on it, there can be multiple outcomes for that measurement uh, that are given by basically overlapping that state with what's called eigenstates of that, right. that measurement. And then you square that and that tells you what the probability is. Mm -hmm. But so all you get is a probability of a measurement, right? And so 
uh, this is very different from our classical experience where if, if I do the measurement, I actually get an answer right? Right. And, and I get like a specific an answer. It may be different, it may be a different answer every time, but it is a specific answer every time. So quantum mechanics in that sense tells us about what we expect when you do a series of measurements and, and you certainly then expect that those averages will follow you know, what that uh, Warren postulate says. But it doesn't really enlighten us on what like a specific uh, measurement uh, does. And so uh, a few years ago, I had this eureka moment where I finally thought, now I understand this, uh, even though there are people like Feynman who claim that like nobody will ever understand quantum measurement. And uh, I think our solution to this problem is actually that uh, uh, many body localization is a phenomenon that occurs in the Schrodinger equation, which is the main equation in quantum mechanics. Um, uh, when you have large disordered systems. And when you're doing a measurement, that's what you really do. You have like a small system that you're measuring and then you have a large system that you call the detector, right? That's doing the measurement. And I think what we've concluded is actually that quantum localization um, with just running the Schrodinger equation actually can lead to uh, measurement processes. Or another way of saying it is that even though the Schrodinger equation is a unitary equation and measurement looks like a non-unitary problem, that's really the you know, how do you get these two things together? It turns out actually any kind of subsystem that you're looking at you know, in, its, in its dynamics uh, actually has that nonlinearity coming out of it as an emergent phenomenon, even though the Schrodinger equation is a linear equation. And we think that solves the problem. And we've actually run computer simulations on this um, where we prepare some system like a photon that could be going to the left or to the right with probability of 60% one way, 40% the other way. And we run these simulations, letting it interact with large detector-like systems. And indeed, what it does is the energy goes one way 60% of the time and 40% the other way of the time. But it actually goes one way or the other. So any individual measurement mm. actually satisfies the Born postulate. Um, and, but you do get the correct statistics. And this is purely just from running Schrodinger dynamics. But the key is you have to run it in very large dimensional systems that can give you what's called many body or quantum localization. So that's one thing that we're interested in. Uh, something at the totally opposite end of the spectrum is um, we got interested in how proteins interact with one another. And you know, people used to assume 50 years ago that cells are kind of just like bags of fluid and that everything in them, proteins, whatever, is just mm -hmm. kind of a jumble that's sort of moving around. But you know, there's a lot more structure than that to cells. And in fact, there are uh, these uh, things called metabolons or or these very loosely bound protein complexes where proteins don't really stick to each other really well. They just kind of you know, court one another sort of a little mm. bit. Right? Uh, but that's actually already enough, for instance, to enhance reaction rates. Because you know, if some protein makes something, an enzyme, then it doesn't need to go very far to get to the next enzyme to do another step in the reaction. And so we study these things. And, and uh, years back, I uh, was uh, at a place in Germany, in the, the Max Planck Institute for Medicine in Heidelberg. And I, they opened this room to me that was like dark blue light only. And there were thousands of aquaria lining the walls um, that were filled with zebrafish, like disappearing in the dark shadows in the horizon. It was kind of like, again, this is a movie that many people nowadays maybe have, haven't watched anymore. But there's a scene at the end of Indiana Jones, you know, the original Raiders of the Lost Ark, where the Ark has been handed over to the US government. And, it is in a wooden box among millions of wooden boxes in a gigantic hangar and you'll never find it again, right, kind of thing. Um, so this is what that room looked like to me. And I said, this is cool. I need to do experiments with zebrafish. I don't care what the experiment <laughs> is. <laughs> I need to do an experiment with zebrafish. And so a few years later, uh, the opportunity arose. So we actually set up a colleague of mine, Jan Schemler in physics, and I set up a, a lab in, uh, where we grow zebrafish. And uh, we learned how to husband them. And, you know, there's all kinds of things. You need to keep the animals alive. And there's regulations and whatever, you know, uh, for animals. And, and so we figured all this out. Again, lots of mistakes. And, but again, after a few years, we kind of knew what we were doing. And so now we can actually do these experiments. Where we could put these animals under a, a microscope. And we can use uh, genetic manipulation to change, the, to make it a genetically engineered animal. But instead of the entire animal being genetically changed, only a few cells in the animal are genetically changed. And we can express the protein that we want to look at. It's dynamic, like how does it talk to other proteins just in that cell and then have it light up through fluorescence. And so you can stick this animal under the microscope and you'll find there's like one cell <laughs> over there that you can zoom in on. And then you can see how that protein behaves inside that cell. And then you, and like maybe it's a nerve cell. And then you go, go to another one uh, and genetically engineer it so that it does it with a 
skin cell or a muscle cell. Mm. And so we can actually look at individual tissue types. Whereas if you made the entire animal glow, I mean, you've seen these things on the news where they make like whatever animal glow green nowadays, right? right? So that wouldn't have worked for us because then everything would glow and you wouldn't be able to tell like, a muscle from a, yeah, and we needed to isolate it. And so we figured out an alternative way of doing this where rather than the whole fish glowing green, we can just make like one cell mm. in the fish uh, uh, glow green. So that's kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum because one end of the spectrum is sort of biology experiments and the other end of the spectrum is like computational physicists, you know, you know writing software you know, to do quantum simulations. Maybe think about how they're both connected to each other. Oh, they're only connected, I, as far as I know, you know by the fact that uh, I found them both interesting. In, in one case, because it's just a problem that you get stuck with, right, when you do quantum mechanics eventually, like, you know, why is it like that? And the other one, as I said, because I walked into a dimly lit blue room that had like aquaria, thousands of them disappearing in the, you know, fading in the back of the room. It's like, that was too cool. I need to do that. <laughs> so, you know, the reasons can be very different you know, uh, for why you end up doing something. I mean, sometimes it's more directed because you know really something about it. And sometimes it's just silly, like, this is cool. I want like a blue room with fish as well. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's how it started. But then usually it gets serious after a while, right? Once you figure out what you can do with it. I mean, I think like a different question to ask that question would be, do you think uh, there's a place for quantum physics in biology? Um, there certainly is in, in some ways. So for instance, uh, I mean, I mentioned enzymes as, as proteins that run chemical reactions. So it turns out actually some of these enzymes actually trans port or move hydrogen atoms or protons around. And those are actually light enough uh, that they can be in two places at once and they can tunnel through barriers that would be classically mm -hmm. forbidden. So actually to predict how those enzymes behave correctly, you actually do need quantum mechanics to predict what's going on. And then of course, a lot of phenomena in biology rely on electron transfer processes or energy transfer processes. So like the, the very process that allows all life on Earth to occur, uh, which is energy harvesting, which in plants occurs through photosynthesis. Let's take that example, right? These are quantum mechanical processes that require some quantum mechanics to actually properly describe them. But that said, there's also a lot of processes in biology, though, uh, where things are dephasing enough and randomized enough, and there are enough of an ensemble property of multiple objects that you don't need to worry about quantum coherence or tunneling or <laughs> phenomena like that. And you can perfectly well describe these processes just using classical mechanics or even higher level stuff, right? I mean, there's like quantum mechanics and you could describe things classically. And eventually you could have things like systems biology, right? Where you think really more in terms of networks. It's actually much more computer science-like mm -hmm. than, than sort of worrying about the chemistry of things. And there are just certain pro problems that are more solvable at that level than worrying about what every single electron mm. is doing. So that's often face a scientist. You have to make that choice at what level of abstraction are you going to study the problem, right? And if I want to understand ecology, I'm not going to worry about uh, you know, um, quark interactions and, and uh, gluons, mm. right? <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe eventually you could get ecology as an emergent phenomenon from that, but it's like many, many you know, layers away from that. So you have to pick like the right layer uh, to look at in order to do your research. And so that, you know, the quantum mechanics stuff that we do is at a certain layer that's, you know, uh, well below ecology, somewhat above elementary particles, right? And the uh, in-cell biology is, you know, somewhat more on that biology side, but still, still pretty far away from say, right. something like ecology, but well above the level of quantum measurement, for example. So, so you pick different, uh, and this is one of the hardest things in science, actually, is that what we call emergent phenomena, right? Because Deep down, many scientists, and I am one of them, do believe that if you understand the fundamental equations of nature, like the Schrodinger equation, or better versions like quantum field theory, whatever, then you should in principle be able to derive other phenomena like chemistry and biology and so forth from it. But in practice, that's not how it, how it works. You know, if you understand the theory of quarks very well, it's a long step to actually coming to the conclusion that animals interact in certain ways that can be modeled by ecological systems equations, right? Mm. Uh, and so, uh, so emergent phenomena are a really tough thing for scientists when you go like from one length scale to another and, and how do you connect these length scales to one another? I think that's one of the trickiest things actually in science. And for that reason, actually, a lot of scientists prefer to study, I think, like one kind of length scale and one type of phenomenon because then you don't have to sort of switch back and forth. Uh, between these things. But I think there's a lot of excitement in, in these things where you're like switching from one thing to another, like from quantum mechanics to chemistry to biology, mm. things of that sort. Right, because like the link between the scales is not, is not trivial, it's like not, not obvious how... Yeah, it's exactly. It's just not clear, you know, even if you understand how electrons move around the molecule, 
that doesn't really tell you how a cell functions. <laughs> right. right. I mean, in the end, we do believe, or at least I'm, as I said, one of those people who thinks that, well, if I really knew what all the molecules are doing and how they're correlated in time and space mm -hmm. and, and how everything's comparing, eventually I could have a description of a cell. Um, but certainly I don't think anybody right now right. has a full description of that, although there are people working on it. One of my colleagues, Sam Schulten, in, in chemistry and biophysics, actually does model whole cells. Like, all the organelles, all the molecules, all the chemical reaction networks, everything. And they're trying actually to get a cell to work right now. It's still going to take a few years, is my guess, that would actually just spontaneously divide on a computer, the computer model, you know, without you building that in. Because, right. of course, you can build it in and it'll do it, but, but it just does it, right? And <clears throat> when you reach that kind of ability that you have, let's say, a cell that you're modeling and you're not building into it that it has to divide, it just does it at some point, then you know that you have a pretty deep understanding of the system but it's very difficult because it's you know again life is an emergent phenomenon and just because you know chemistry doesn't mean you know how life functions so. maybe that there's a good opportunity there like doing science in, in, in doing those things no there is I, I think that's one of the places where i try to look is like where are places where things sort of connect like the quantum measurement problem is also like that right it's we know what happens classically and we know what basic you know the schrodinger equation is telling us and the question is is there a way of connecting these things in a more reliable way than, than you know, we've had in the past? You know, you, you do and you did a lot of you know, computer science things and you know, program, programs and things like that. You think the universe works in <clears throat> the more, I don't, like, I don't want to say simulation, but... Uh, Computational. In, 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 in oh, no, no, people have asked, actually, somebody asked me that question two days ago at a meeting. Really? Uh, you know, like, is, is the universe perhaps just a simulation? Right? Like computation. And, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think it would be very hard to prove that that's not the case. Um, but, I, I, so, but I can tell you that it might even be in principle possible to figure out where, whether we are a simulation or not. And, and here's the reason, but I mean, this is just a wild guess. It would be complete garbage, but I'll, I'll go for it anyway. Um, if you believe quantum mechanics is correct, and since we were just talking of measurement theory, then actually anybody who's running a simulation would eventually probably want an answer from it, because otherwise why are you running, you know, why are you running the simulation? <laughs> yeah. To do that, you need to interact with the system. If the system is a quantum system, you are going to perturb that system. And this will actually manifest itself uh, as weird behavior of the system for entities that are part of that system. And so I think you would actually be able to tell if that were going on. Um, on the other hand, let's again take some variation of this. Maybe we're not a simulation, but maybe we're a high school experiment. <laughs> you know, somebody made <coughs> a black hole um, that, that, uh, you know, that they kept in some cage somewhere in the high school in right. some more advanced you know, place. Um, and, and they don't even realize that actually inside of that there is, you know, like a whole universe doing stuff. Because it turns out I think the density of our universe is not far off from the density of a black hole that would be about the diameter of a, a visible universe, you know, like 14 billion light years. So it's not completely crazy, you know, to think something like this could be the case. But then, you know, this wouldn't be a simulation, right? They would have made it and maybe they wouldn't even have a way of interacting with the interior of whatever they made. And so then we could still be made, but we wouldn't be a, a you know, simulation in that case because nobody's ever expecting to get an outcome from doing this uh, you know, thing. Um, so be just like we, right? I mean, we, uh, you know, um, you could argue, for instance, that an artwork in a way is a simulation, right? Because if I paint something, it is a representation, perhaps even of a fairly literal reality, or perhaps more of a state of mind that's more abstract, right? And whatever it is, but it's a representation of something. In that sense, it is a model. In that sense, it is a simulation of something. But I would still, if, if you asked me, like, am I going to call paintings a simulation? And I would say no. I mean, art is an emergent phenomenon. It has its own values and its own uh, reasons for doing it. And art is actually much more than a right. simulation, right? And so in that sense, I would also say, even if we are the creation of a high school kid in a <laughs> other level universe, you know, still, I, I, you know, uh, unless they are really doing this to get a computational result out of it, we're not a simulation. <laughs> Do you believe in free will? So that's also a difficult to answer question. Um, and, and the reason is uh, there are sort of two layers to this. Uh, one is, do you believe in unpredictability? Mm -hmm. And then the other one is, do you believe in free will? So I for sure believe in unpredictability. And uh, so the idea of unpredictability is just the question, uh, not do you have free will, but is there any entity in the universe that could ever predict what you're actually going to do, right? And to me, that's actually practically already, I'll turn that off. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, 
to me, that's actually already, uh, unpredictability is already good, good news, right? And so I firmly believe in that. And the reason is that any physical theories that we've come up with, uh, whether it's classical mechanics or quantum mechanics, are in fact unpredictable. Mm. So in classical mechanics, it arises because systems of many bodies uh, are very sensitive to initial conditions because you know, like eventually molecules hit one another. And if this molecule had been only a little bit further over to that side, it'll hit it differently. And before you know it, one day later, there will be a storm somewhere where there wasn't, right. okay? Right. So that's one reason. But, but even in quantum mechanics, actually, because uh, again, the Born you know, theorem that measurement outcomes are unpredictable, even our theory of how we think measurements really happen says the same thing. It agrees with the Born prediction. Mm -hmm. And so the measurements may have a specific outcome, but that outcome is still essentially unpredictable. And the reason is that the detector is a very many degree of freedom system that quantum localizes in a more or less unpredictable fashion. And so you can't tell whether it would have gone to the left or to the right, even though it specifically does go to one side or to the other side. And so quantum mechanics also has that unpredictability. So I'm very convinced that, that we are completely unpredictable. Now, being unpredictable is not the same as free will, <laughs> uh, because free will also implies that there's some kind of a conscious entity mm -hmm. that actually um, uh, you know, can reason about itself. And you know, there's, you know, so you could, for instance, postulate that we have sensory information that comes in, some of it gets stored in memory, but then we can actually recall these memories and reason about them or have uh, you know, uh, uh, perceive them. And, and we understand that, hey, I must be there because even though when I close my eyes, I'm not seeing you, I can actually imagine you with your glasses and your shirt and everything you know, in front of me when I close my eyes. And so that fact shows that you know, I, it's not just purely perception. There's something there right, that's ticking. Uh, and that's sort of you know, one way to think about you know, an ingredient of, of consciousness. And so I would, I would make the argument that if you're unpredictable and consciousness really exists, then we probably have free will. But I couldn't answer that with certainty. Hmm. Uh, but the unpredictability question, I'm willing to say, I'm totally sure. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about, like you mentioned, that if we were in a simulation, the the simulator would have to interact with the system. Yes, that alone would already mess it up. Right, and that would, like, I'm trying to imagine, like, a universal wave function collapse. Yes, and, like, exactly. And so from that point of view, so if you believe in quantum mechanics, I think you could actually make the argument that uh, if there is an entity outside right, that, that uh, is uh, interacting with the system, that that interaction already will mess up the system even in a way that entity can't control, mm. right? Um, and, you know, we'll see how often it continues before she realizes, no, not yet. Um, so, uh, so let's see, where was my train of thought? Uh, the simulated the, yeah, yeah, so, so, you know, so, so if, if an entity actually were to interrogate the system because of quantum mechanics, right, that would already perturb the system and, and change it enough that then something different is going to happen. So I think that combination, uh, but there is a lot of ifs still in there, right? So you have to actually, for instance, believe that quantum mechanics is really a theory that accurately describes how everything works. And as you know, there are a lot of people who don't want to buy that. There are still many people around, even some physicists, who think there must be some kind of realist theory underneath all of this mm -hmm. that is completely deterministic and and so then this these kinds of things can't happen and if everything were truly deterministic then you know maybe then the free will question is not as obvious again right um, but i would say i believe enough in quantum mechanics <laughs> and or and even if that fails you know all the other theories that we've come up with always have that sensitivity thing that they are sensitive to conditions or to measurement or to anything like that and so i think it's a pretty good bet mm -hmm. but i don't know for sure whereas the the simpler question of unpredictability, I'm pretty sure of. That's a fascinating point I've never heard before, that it that perhaps we are truly a simulation, but until there's an observer, like someone went for the result, then it's like for someone inside the simulation, just it's normal. It's, it's like... It's yeah, and whatever. not only that, and you wouldn't be able to predict anything because, you know, the rules of this, if we are a simulation, the rules of the simulation are classical mechanics at a bigger level and quantum field right. theory at some lower level. But, but all of these are theories that are inherently eventually unpredictable. Right. And so therefore, you know, so another way of putting it is that if you have an overall system and you have a subsystem in it, that subsystem by interrogating already some other subsystem already changes the way that subsystem behaves. Therefore, that subsystem is unpredictable. Therefore, you could never tell precisely what I am going to do in the future. And therefore, from that point of view, I have free will as far as you're concerned, right? And, and again, if an outside entity that has to obey quantum mechanics is subject to the same, then, then it's even true in that sense, right? If there's an outside entity. Um, 
but you know, but we don't know for sure whether quantum mechanics is really the ultimate theory and so forth. And that's why right. that's a question that I, you know, if I had, to, if you forced me to, I would say, yeah, probably we have free will, but but uh, <laughs> but I can't say for sure because we don't know whether these you know, uh, theories are, are correct or not. And so the only thing I'm willing to say is that we are unpredictable, mm. <laughs> and that I'm pretty sure. A question which I keep coming back to very often is um, that why do we perceive time at the speed that mm -hmm. we do? Like, I know you do some research in mm -hmm. like going to the lowest scale of time that you can yeah. measure, but that's right, which is way out of the range right, of where exactly. we perceive time. Right, exactly. Like, why why do we perceive time at the rate that we do? Yeah, well, this is actually a question that probably somebody like Gene could have answered better, since he studies you know these, he studies bees and insects and, and and studies issues of like that. But so I'll give you an answer that somebody gave at a brain conference that I attended a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, and again, I went to this conference even though we don't do brain research because I thought, that sounds interesting, maybe mm. I want to do research on that. So right. let's go to a meeting <laughs> and hear what the people are talking about. And so one of the ideas, talking about consciousness again actually, was this idea that there's brain circuitry in your thalamus and your cortex that sort of circles back and forth and is able to both examine sensory information as well as actually examine memory information. And, and, and uh, through this cycle, actually sort of uh, become self-perceptive because, you know, as I said, you know, I can close my eyes and I know you're still there and you're still wearing that same you know, you know, shirt and everything. And I, don't, I can see with my mind's eye, mm -hmm. right? And that's what convinces me that I'm conscious and not just a simulation, right. let's say, right? Because for all you know, I'm not conscious, right? I could just be some automaton that's doing <laughs> this stuff and talking, whatever. But you know you're conscious <laughs> and I think I know I'm conscious, so I'm willing to give you the benefit of the, uh, the doubt. Um, but, uh, okay, this time he gave up you know, quickly, but it, it makes, mis, mix, mix, mixes up my train of thought every time. So what was, what was the... Uh, time. Uh, yeah, the perception of time, that's right. So at that meeting, um, I'm usually quite focused, but the ringing of that phone definitely <laughs> gets me uh, messed up. So talking about that, the, uh, the circuitry actually in your brain operates actually at a rate of about 20 hertz. Okay? And so anything that runs faster than that, you perceive as a continuous phenomenon. So, for instance, when you're watching a movie, movie right, okay. you don't have to run a movie at 10,000 frames per second. Right. You can run it at 20 frames 20, per second. Yeah. And it looks to you like it's a continuous movie. But if you run it at 10 frames per second, you begin to see that it's like mm -hmm. doing that, right? And for that same reason, for instance, sounds that are actually below 20 hertz, you perceive as separate knocks, right? If I go this 10 times per second, you don't think of that as a, mm -hmm. but, but if I go, ah, uh, you know, at 400 hertz or whatever, then you hear that as a, as a pitch. Continuous. That's a continuous pitch right. now, right? and I go ah or whatever, and so you hear the pitch uh, going up and down. And so I think one element in human perception is ultimately how fast it's, the circuitry operates, and this actually has very physics-related reasons for it. Like how long does it take neurons to communicate, and how long do sort of certain feedback reactions and and uh, uh, you know how long does the firing take? How long does it take for calcium waves to propagate and all these kinds of things? And so that's actually kind of the number you come up with if you sort of figure about mm. what the size of the brain is. So mice have much smaller brains than we do, uh, and birds actually have you know similar sized brains and are quite capable of cognition. I would say. I mean, again, this is unproven, but a lot of people who study birds certainly would say that birds are able of cognition just like humans are, um, and they do it with tinier brains. So actually, my guess would be that birds are have a different perception of time, right, right. Uh, like a much faster one, right? Like a colibri when it flies around probably doesn't think of its wings as some blurred thing. It probably thinks of it as literally going, me right. doing this. So like so, it's like dodging a bullet, yeah. like, right. May, yeah. Right, and a, a colibri, may, I, maybe it still can't dodge a bullet because that's really going fast. But but yeah, a colibri would be closer in its perception to yeah. of time to actually being able to dodge a bullet. And it's actually very interesting because it can change for humans too. So I'm, I'm sure you've been in situations where an accident is happening to you uh, like you're you're on black ice and you're falling off the bike, right? And at least my perception of this is that the moment that happens, I actually realize it's happening, and my perception slows way down. Uh, so I, I see much more, you know, in like slow motion detail what's really? about to happen, right? And but then the weird thing is, you would think that when that happens, now you could take action. Um, so like I can move to correct or something like that, right. but somehow my limbs are still not uh, willing to do anything any faster. And so even though I know I'm going to fall, I'm going to fall over there, whatever, and if I moved my arm like this way, it would be better, whatever, I can't do it because my brain is not able to actually you know, make that motion happen. And so it's kind of my perception is faster, 
but my body isn't willing to do anything any faster than I was able to do it beforehand. So it's a kind of weird feeling. And I felt it a number of times when I had accidents uh, where like things slow down and I see the action in slow motion. I can see, okay, now I'm going to crash and now my shoulder's going to break and now this is going to happen. But there's nothing I can do about it because I just can't move you know, fast enough. So it's kind of weird. So I think even humans have like different a range of perception of time. But you know, we're talking about a factor of two or three or something like that, not right, femtoseconds. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, I th but I think there are good physical and physiological reasons for why we perceive time the way we do, and other organisms could perceive it differently, especially if there's some kind of a size scaling involved. And I never thought about that. It's this, you know, so after this, I'm gonna probably go to Google and, and look it up. And you know, either somebody will have um, researched this already, or have another research project. <laughs> right, because I keep coming keep coming back to it because I, I would imagine like, okay, what would the world look like if I perceived time at a faster rate? Mm -hmm. Or, yep. like it would just be, so the, the, the way I got to this question is I was looking at a strobe effect mm -hmm. and that just blew my mind. Yeah, uh, yeah, I saw absolutely. that like how something <clears throat> that's moving so fast, you mm -hmm. can perceive it you as You can still see it if you do it correctly like by the light. Yeah, exactly. exactly the exactly. lights exactly. that are shining exactly. on it, right? Exactly. So exactly. I, I kept thinking, okay, what implications could this have? How can you make something that's going really fast and turn that into something really slow? Exactly. And it works in both directions. Like, you know, like one idle thought I occasionally have is, you know, there's 8 billion people on Earth. And while that's still a much smaller number of people than, let's say, neurons in a, in a human brain or anything like that, still it's a pretty large number. And how do we know actually there isn't some supra-organism um, that basically we are just elements of it and you and I sitting here and coming together is like neurons making a connection and will disconnect again, whatever. And there's actually this very slow operating super-organism that has these eight million elements mm. in it. And it's actually thinking deep, slow thoughts and solving problems that we haven't even thought of yet. Uh, because we don't actually realize that right. as right. a community in a society, we are just these elements. Like your individual neurons you know, don't know <laughs> right. what they're doing in the, in the bigger scheme of things, right? So maybe we are just you know, like a part of a, you know, a, a mega, a, a meta brain or something like that. Who knows, right? I mean, I'm just making this up, but who knows? I mean, you could argue that we are in, in, in many ways, like just mm -hmm. like just how institutions and incentives just kind of. That's work. right. I mean, it's all it's very coherent, right? I mean, yeah. certainly humans don't interact in a random way at all. It's all very coherent with things getting built. But I'm actually going even one step further and saying, how do we know this is not like a thinking organism that's actually solving a math problem right now or something pretty concrete, right? Right. As opposed to just sort of a certain organization, right? Which needs the three yeah, of us yeah. to be talking right now. Someone else to be driving a car. Right. Someone else eating food. That's right. And right. all of this will come together in some way that somehow you know, helps with this. Right? Right. Just like our neurons are firing in complex ways that we don't fully understand, but it actually allows our thought processes to occur. Anyway, it's just, I'm just making this up, but <laughs> who knows, right? Another research project. Yeah, another project. Well, <laughs> yeah. as I said, ideas are like, I, you, I can come up with an idea per minute, right? Dime a dozen, so that's not a problem. Uh, in, in fact, you know, that's probably the most important thing for having aptitude in science. Is I would say if I picked one thing is that you can just chat with somebody and you have like 10 ideas already of mm. stuff you can research, right? Because that's my, how my brain works, right? So I'm sitting here and everything you tell me, I'm analyzing like, does somebody know this already? I could check on Google. If not, you know, put that into the bin of possible research <laughs> uh, projects. And so this way I generate like dozens of research projects a day, sometimes hundreds. Right? Wow. And of course I do only like a tiny fraction of them because in, in, again, in the end, you've got to get grant money, students need to yeah. work on it. You know, there's like time involved and so you can't do everything. Uh, and so I end up doing like 0.01% of the stuff that I thought I might do. I could do, but, but you know, so you have to pick something. What's your interaction with the community with, like you come up with all these research projects, right? And obviously you're, you're limited by your own time and resources, but there are other people in the world, mm -hmm. if they if they knew, had this thought that you had, mm -hmm. that they could work on it and then, like mm -hmm. you could form, like we're living in a time where like the digital internet, mm -hmm. then this digital community is such as right. it could be. Exactly, information should flow much more easily. Right, right. right. And so then you can, so, I mean, I do this at, at <coughs> Zoom meetings or, or conferences or however I end up meeting people. But like at this meeting where I was just a couple of days ago, which was a protein meeting. Yeah, I mean, I, I had discussions with people and at least 100 ideas of you could do this, could right, do that. Right. And I'm not going to do probably most of them, but you know, maybe somebody will do Someone else. I mean, certainly there were some discussions that I had with a person where they said, oh, hmm. I think I'm going to do that experiment. I'm like, okay, take it away. 
I, I'm, I certainly am. I'm not planning on doing it, so go <laughs> for it. <laughs> you can have it. <laughs> um, and I, I, actually, it's a puzzle to me to some extent how uh, sometimes scientists seem to get a little grubby with their ideas and mm. secretive or whatever. And, and, so, um, and so I'm not grubby or secretive with my ideas at all because if I'm telling you something, even if it's something I thought is really neat and I should research this, it's okay if you do it, I'll find something else by tomorrow <laughs> that is just as interesting or more interesting. I'll just do that. It's that so, that's why I'm, so I'm not too worried in, mm. in that sense. There's infinitely many interesting problems out there. You know, maybe I'm exaggerating, but you know, even if not infinite, very, 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 a very large. A large finite number. Almost. A large, yeah. If it's a finite yeah. number, it's definitely a very, very large. Right. Yeah, yeah and, and most of the times when you tell someone the idea, most likely they're not going to work at it because they, they didn't arrive there like they don't have enough context to actually work on it yeah that's but right if anything they would you would get like inspiration from just talking to the yeah, people and yeah. getting feedback and just seeing different yeah. ways where it could go exactly. yeah i agree with you i mean even in other things that are not like even in places where not a science related yeah, it doesn't have to be science it could be Every, anything that has to everywhere with people ideas like, and how seem you to be secretive yeah. about things and yeah, yeah it, it's a yeah. uh, like being open just yeah. give you another like dimension yeah. of like yeah and and again you know at my age, I've known lots of people and seen them through their lives and, and so forth. And this is, again, one of those things where there is, I'm sure there's a genetic component. I mean, there's mm -hmm. nurture and nature components to right, everything. Right. You know, going back to, you mentioned, you know, gene, that was a sort of discussion topic. And I think the safest bet is always to say it's kind of half and half, roughly, yes. plus or minus, right? And I, I mean, I've, I know a lot of people right, throughout my life, and I can definitely tell there are some people who are just more secretive with their stuff, like they want to, to keep it to themselves. And, and if you use it too, they remind you, like, that was my thing, right? Mm. And there's other people who are like, I don't care, whatever. You, that was, I told you that, I can't even remember, just whatever, <laughs> right? And so people just are different. Uh, our brains all function differently. Uh, and, and I've come to respect that, that, you know, that, that's how it is. That, um, so, so I think some people are going to have an easy time with this and other people would have a tough time with it. And you'll find people, I think, in all walks of life that are like more one way or more uh, the other way. And I certainly, I think there are scientists who do great work, but they are pretty secretive <laughs> about it. And I think there are scientists who do great work, and, and you know, they don't care at all. They'll tell anyone. So um, I, I think it can work out either way. You should make a blog or a website where you publish like weekly all these like new problems that you come up with. And you should. Yeah, but the problem is, if it's like a hundred a day, then you know, I'm basically just spending all my time <laughs> writing the blog. I need to have time to actually think about, you know. 0.1% of these things or something like that. So uh, that's always the problem. Time, right? We have this. Time. Like, time is just very limited. Uh, and so you have to just pick something. And you were asking me before, do I have regrets? And I would say very few. And the reason is, again, I think I could have done something else. Uh, and it could have been actually just as interesting. Maybe it would have been even more important, right? And who knows right. how it would have come out. I couldn't have predicted it. But that's just how it is. And so in the end, you have to pick some problems or mm. do some stuff. And even though alternatives could have been very good as well, as long as you pick something that you think caters to your strengths and that you find interesting, I think you're good. Mm. So you love making mistakes. You yeah, just said yeah. That, uh, but yeah. what's been the, the the favorite mistake you've ever made? The biggest mistake that I've ever made, or, or favorite, or my favorite, you know, mistake that I've ever made. I'll, I mean, you know, again, I'll, I'll give you a sports example, but I could give you a science example as well. I, I tend to be very trusting when people say, let's like do this or that thing in, 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 in like a bike riding or whatever. And then, and then people do things that are not safe and I'm like, I know this is not good, but I'll just go along. And the next thing I'm in the hospital. <laughs> and, and I even knew it beforehand. I was literally thinking like, I should now stop doing this and, and like take a turn here, just let them, you know, and I, and I don't do it. And, and the result is more often than not that something happens, right? So when that alarm bell goes off, I, I should listen to it. And I'd actually do most of the time, otherwise I'd probably be a wreck. But, uh, but I don't listen to it always, even though very often, you know, there's that voice in my head that says, this is not wise, mm. uh, and, and I uh, do it anyway. Uh, and that happens also in science sometimes. You know, you think that a project could take you somewhere, um, but you have a misgiving about it somehow, but you do it anyway. But then you actually figure out later, you talk to someone and you've invested some time in it. Mm -hmm. And they tell you, well, I could have told you that so-and-so's theorem says that this is impossible. And it's like, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> if I had known. Yeah. And then I check it, of course, and I say, like, yeah, you were right. You know. So forget this thing. I, I'm not going to spend any more time you know, trying to prove what's impossible to prove. So, uh, so it happens, right? But again, the cost is relatively, the cost of this is smaller than the cost of like avoiding doing anything because you're worried you know, that it might not be the right thing to do. So I say better make the mistakes 
and uh, end up wasting some time once in a while uh, than, than to never make any mistakes but never you know get anything real done so is there something I mean you've done many things about many different areas but is, is there something that you've been dreaming about doing for a long time but you for some reason you haven't get to doing that oh yeah we all have these things like actually you were speaking of the uh, uh, web space telescope right so mm -hmm. Uh, and actually, as a graduate student, I worked in an area called astrochemistry, where you oh. measure molecules that could show up in outer space, and then you go to radio telescopes and see if the detect molecules them. there and detect them. And uh, but I gave up on that and did other things, you know, later. And uh, but now, actually, one of my dreams is I want to see if I can publish a paper in an astrophysical journal someday. Mm. <laughs> so and the way I imagine I would do it is, but I haven't had the time. But I will take the time at some point. Right? At some point, I'm going to go like, okay, this is it. You know, I'm going to say no to this thing, and I'm going to spend the time on doing that. But you know, astronomers, I think in particular, are really good about data sharing. So all of these telescopes, all the data is out there, and it's available publicly actually, you know, because it's government-funded mm -hmm. uh, data. And so you can actually go online and access the real primary scientific data that also uh, astronomers work with. Of course, you might do it a little bit later, right? they, they, the, the people who sort of directly go to it, but there's so much data to mine in there that even if you do it uh, years later, there's probably new stuff that you can find in the data. So the way I imagine doing this <coughs> is that I'll find some time over a summer at some point, and I'll mine those databases with some problems in mind. I'm a hobby astronomer anyway, so I have some ideas of things mm. that might be interesting to look at. And, and then uh, maybe I can actually do something that's new enough that it would actually be worth you know, a publication in astrophysical journal. So we'll see if that ever happens, but you, know, you <laughs> never know, right? <laughs> a similar question with, with a different angle. I, I'm sure you, you'll have a long life, but uh, if you, let's say, where, like where to die, let's say tomorrow or in mm -hmm. a year, what's one thing that you definitely would, would want to be doing before you, that happens? Oh, uh, you know, I mean, I could... I'll pick something totally at random, right? Not because it's some important thing or anything okay, like okay. that, but uh, hey, uh, skydiving, right? I've never jumped out of a plane. <laughs> that sounds okay. like it. I think it would appeal to me. Uh, but uh, and the kids are out of the house now, so even if I even the parachute were not to go, <laughs> it would be you know, unfortunate, but you know, not the same catastrophe as it might have been 20 years ago or something like that. So we all have things like that that we want to do, and, and but for some reason or other haven't found the time or or will or or uh, suppressed our fears, right, ever mm. to, to do it. So, and I mean, and that's not a skydiving, is not like some, it's not a thing that one must do as a life goal or for my research or anything like that. It's just a random thing. Right. right. That's a little dangerous, probably not very dangerous, but a little bit dangerous. And, that, that, uh, and I know, you know, I know people who have died skydiving personally as friends. Really? Oh, yeah. So it's not, and, you know, so it is, there is some danger uh, <laughs> in it. Uh, but I've also done things that, like skydiving, have a fraction of a percent probability that you might die or get seriously injured, and I've done them anyway. And so this doesn't seem like that outlandish compared to some stuff that I've done. Maybe. So, we, but, so yeah. we all have things like that right, that we'd like to do right. that we haven't done yet. Um, On this, um, like you mentioned accidents, right? And the the reason you got the name Honey Badger was because you were in a race and yeah, yeah. you had a terrible accident. <laughs> well, it was, fortunately it was not super terrible, it was unpleasant, but uh, yeah, I was doing an Ironman in, in North Carolina. And, uh, and I, you know, I, unfortunately people who do travel and spend too much time looking at their sports watches, uh, checking their heart rates mm -hmm. and speed and stuff like that, which I've actually given up on doing now. So I've, I, I wised up after that incident. So I was doing that and I didn't see that a cone had fallen over on the mm. road. And I crashed full speed into it and just flew off the bike. And I broke a few ribs, and, but, but I was in the middle of the race and it was an expensive race and, and so forth. And I wasn't totally sure that I broke my ribs, but it did feel like it. And, uh, and so I just took four ibuprofen and hopped back on the bike and finished the bike, which is another 100 miles. And then I ran a marathon. Right. And I mean, you have to do an, and then I and checked then into the emergency down. room, and, and yes, indeed, I had broken ribs, uh, and and it was definitely hell the next day. It was like the most painful drive ever back home from North Carolina back to, back to here, um, which only shows that when you have a lot of adrenaline in the system, right, you can do things that normally you, you know, definitely wouldn't think would be wise. But you know, broke ribs, so it was pretty unpleasant. But broke ribs are probably about the mildest thing where mm. you can still then do something, right? Uh, you know as opposed to like a bone poking out of your shoulder. Right. At some point, you know, that's it, you're kind of done. Although I've known people who've done that, they've had bones, but they'll still finish, right? Even if, if, even if something like that happens. So, 
you know, uh, and so the honey badger came from, um, again, this is a meme that is long forgotten probably by now, <laughs> but in about 2012 when I did that race, there was this thing on YouTube uh, where a honey badger was fighting with a cobra and then got bitten and looked like it died, but then it got up again later on and jumped after the cobra and ate the cobra. And, and so I had that bike accident and then like a couple of weeks later I went to give a lecture in Vietnam and I ate some cobra, like somebody actually sliced the cobra open and gave me the beating heart and I ate it. And there's a photo that my friends saw. And so they knew that happened and they knew this happened. So they went, okay, gets up after crashing, finishes, you know, eats cobras, you know, <laughs> honey badger. <laughs> Uh, which was a more flattering nickname than the previous one. <laughs> so it replaced... Yeah, which was? Uh, Actually, I'm trying to remember now. I guess I've suppressed it from my mind. But there is a TV show, which again, you might not remember, called Futurama, which was done by the same person, Matt Groening, who did The Simpsons. And in it was an alien creature with... The Nibbler, that's what it was. It was an alien creature would eat anything inside, you know, in, 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 in near infinite quantities. And I am definitely, I have a large food capacity. I was actually, when I was like in grad school, I participated in these, you know, eating competitions. <laughs> like how fast can you? And it was kind of fun because I'm like skinny looking guy. Those are the dangerous guys in those competitions. And it would be like these burly big guys, you know, and they were like, ha, right. ha, ha, you're kidding me. But by the sixth or seventh calzone, each one of them being like this big, they're like, okay, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> no, no problem. I can put them no matter what. <laughs> Did you win? Uh, Did you win ever? Oh yeah, I won. Yeah. First yeah. place? Often, yes. Oh, so wow. you have to, you know, uh, I mean, these were like local competitions, nothing right, right. Yeah, yeah. Or anything like that. Like at, uh, in Pasadena, the local, you know, all you can eat calzone restaurant or something like that. But but yeah, so, uh, but it's interesting because, you know, people who meet skinny looking people think that like, yeah, that person can't eat anything. But <laughs> then you find out otherwise when it comes to the test. So. Uh, you have to, the, the, it's the stomach volume expandability that's the key mm. in eating contests, right? But not, not your like overall body size. It's like, you know, like a snake, right? You, if a snake eats a large animal, you know, it's like, yeah. the bump, you know, it, it, it can expand. And so, again, some human stomachs have more of that capacity than others. And again, I'm sure it's a combination of both training as well as, you know, just some natural phenomena of, how your collect connective tissue in your stomach wall is put together, right? That might be genetic again, you know, again, that nature versus nurture uh, thing. So this was one of the totally useless things that I was good at. <laughs> I don't do it anymore. I mean, you, <clears throat> as you get older, you pay a real price in terms right. of when you eat like huge amounts of fatty food or whatever, you're like toast mm. after that for like a day. Right? I get, I, my te body temperature actually goes up and I feel really drowsy for like hours and hours. And so I don't do it anymore. <laughs> your heart rate goes up. Yeah. Yeah, uh, everything goes up. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you mentioned that <coughs> your, your resting heart rate at some point was like 60 or it was like really... Like no, my resting heart rate is 38. Oh, okay. You know, so it's definitely well, way better oh, wow. than you know, okay, okay. 60. So, <laughs> I've been, so last semester I spent a lot of time reading about heart rates and, and mm -hmm. everything. And in my research, I was just curious and I realized that something I had never thought before is that the heart has a limited number of, of beats. Mm -hmm. And once you get to the number, mm -hmm. you're there. <clears throat> uh, and in the paper, they were saying that, you know, athletes and things like this, they seem to have a lower resting mm -hmm. heart rate. So their, mm -hmm. their, their heart. Um, yeah, we have with, a somewhat lar enlarged with, heart because you do a lot right. of aerobic activity, right? And so, again, your body responds and will grow heart size. Someone that can even happen in somewhat older people. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do it. In fact, it's probably more dangerous as a child because you might get scar tissue or something from heart enlargement. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a function of, of a number of different things, but heart, you know, enlargement, you know, uh, ventricular enlargement is, I think, one of the factors in it. And uh, yeah, I have a friend who actually had a resting heart rate of 29 beats per minute. I mean, people, when he went to the hospital just for routine checkups, the, <laughs> the <laughs> nurses would panic when they put him on the, uh, you know, on the electrocardiogram uh, because of the low rate. And even in my case, people, like, wonder what's, what's going on. And... Uh, uh, but but again, it came through training. Um, that was definitely a significant component. My heart rate was resting heart rate was always fairly low. It was like high 40s. But then through training, it actually went into the high 30s uh, eventually. And if you do exertion that's really you know like uh, very stressful, my resting heart rate will go up. I mean, I can actually tell. I monitor my resting heart rate pretty much every day. I can almost tell you when I'm going to get a cold or something um, because you know my resting heart will go up a few beats and mm -hmm. I know like probably one more day and something is going to show its weird ugly head and it does and I can mm -hmm. tell there's something wrong. 
Um, but there's other reasons for it too, like if you don't sleep well at all, right. you know, then that's certainly something. But if I sleep well and long and I still have an elevated testing, I, I know something is going to mm -hmm. happen. Or if you do sporting events that are very demanding, um, my resting heart rate will go up. Like I was in Switzerland at this competition in August and my resting heart rate during that competition went up to 50 and it took over a month to go back down to below 40 again before I saw less than 40 again. So, yeah. so any kind of stress you put on your body certainly can bring that up. But going back to your thing about you know, longevity, it's actually a very interesting thing. Uh, humans actually have one of the largest number of heartbeats among any creatures you know, uh, in their lifetime. So uh, like mice have much more rapidly beating hearts and they also live much less long than we do. But they actually live, relatively speaking, much less long mm. uh, than we do. Humans actually have, I think, maybe the largest lifespan it, it calculated in... I think turtles and... No, I, turtles might be... No, turtles, I think, are not. Or maybe... I, I, oh, I'm yeah. not going to bet my life on it, but they're or certainly not... Yeah, like but they're certainly, yeah, I, yeah, they're certainly not much higher up. Maybe, because turtles certainly can live uh, even 150, 200 years. But they are... Yeah, uh, uh, and, but their hearts actually beat faster than humans. I don't think they're out of the... There's a, like a size law scaling of how quickly your heart beats with respect to body size. And humans do deviate from that actually in the first place somewhat, but then also get a lot of beats. Um, and, you know, I had somebody once tell me like, well, I don't exercise because when you exercise, your heart beats really fast and then there's only a finite number of beats. They picked up that meme somewhere. And my <laughs> answer to them was, well, that may be true I'm exercising, but the remaining, you know, 16 hours a day, my heart beats way more slower than, right, slowly than exactly. yours. And so, <laughs> sorry, buddy, but if that's your logic, then you're in trouble because I, <laughs> I definitely have fewer heartbeats than you per day because even when I'm sleeping already, I only have 38 beats per minute and you probably have 65 beats per minute or something. So you're, Which like, is a, it's a big you're difference aging like twice as fast almost as, right. as I am. So in, by that, you know, if you really believe that meme. Um, so, but it's, yeah, that's an interesting question. And, and of course, there's sort of, theories of why humans might have a particularly long lifespan. And one of them is a social theory, or the idea that actually in humans there is additional um, survival probability to be gained for offspring because of grandparents. Right? And so while parents are doing things, grandparents can help uh, re raise offspring. And this is a significant uh, improvement in, in survival rate, and therefore it's something that developed in, in social animals. And, and again, you know, uh, various types of primates don't have quite as long a relative mm -hmm. lifespan as we do, but also unusually longer compared to many other animals. And it's probably because primates like bonobos or chimpanzees also have, uh, you know, they have a social structure and actually being a grandparent is potentially something useful. I'm not sure whether it's actually really well researched and understood that that's really true, but I'm sure that I think that's at least like a definite working hypothesis mm -hmm. that people who study this are, you know, are, are working on. How, how did you change your lifestyle after? Because you, you mentioned you were, you participated in fast eating competitions, right? But now you, you're you ultra racing, so I'm sure there was a drastic change in your own lifestyle. Well, less than you might think, because when you're ultra racing, you eat a lot, actually, right? So like at this race where I was in August, I was eating 9,000 calories a day. Oh, right? wow. So that's like, a, you know, it's actually, when you think about it, it's actually hard to eat that much, even if you mm. are feeling like just pigging out like crazy, right? I mean, a typical heavy dinner at a restaurant is maybe 2,500 calories, which is more than really one should be eating for one single meal. But that's only you know, barely more than a quarter of what I needed to eat each day. So I needed to basically eat a full fat, four course restaurant level amount of food you know, to make up the amount of food I needed. And I couldn't actually quite do it. So I was burning uh, over 9,000 calories a day. But in the end, I think on average at that race, I managed to only squeeze in maybe like 6,000 or something like this. So I ended up losing uh, about weight, uh, weight yeah, mm -hmm. but mostly fat though, right? And, and so I ended up losing actually a pound of fat per day, and this was a 10 day long race, so I lost, uh, you know, 10 pounds. Actually, I lost 13 pounds, so even a little bit more than a pound, which is quite a, you know, I mean, I don't weigh that much to begin with, right? I, I'm like 145 pounds. And so if you if you lose 13 <laughs> pounds, you're going from 145 to 132, it's like, oh, you know, my doctor certainly wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> I'm sure if, he, if she knew about it, she doesn't. Um, well, maybe if she watches this <laughs> vlog, but it's too late. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. So, I mean, it's almost actually impossible at these competitions to eat the full amount of calories. But but still, you know, 6,000 calories is like three full restaurant meals a day almost. So, yeah, I was really picking out. So, in that sense, yeah, I'm still doing the, you know, all you can eat. <laughs> I just combine it with all you can exercise at the same time. So, what does your lifestyle look like today? Well, it's not so... 
for the most part, it's much more you know, sedate than that. Right? I mean, <laughs> th th this kind of race I do maybe once every few years. Mm -hmm. So it's expensive and you have to get crews together and there's all kinds of logistics involved. And so my lifestyle is in, in that sense much more boring of get up, eat small granola breakfast, you know, go to work, talk to graduate students, you know, uh, do research related work. Do some exercise. I do like to do exercise at least you know five times a week or something mm. like that. Do more of it over the summer if you're preparing for a race. Less in the middle of winter when mm. it's not you know as convenient and it's cold out and all of these sorts of things. And get a reasonable amount of sleep. Right? I make sure that I go to bed at a reasonable time. Mm. And I have the luxury of doing it now. So my days of coding until four in the morning are passed. <laughs> right? I mean, when it's bedtime, I just go and get some sleep. Uh, and uh, and then you know do something before you go to sleep that sort of allows you to wind down. So uh, like for me, it just doesn't work to try and work until the last minute. I couldn't write computer code or do some research stuff and then suddenly go to sleep 10 minutes right, in bed. Right. But I need to kind of wind down. And so I have hobbies that help you know, do that relaxation. Like you could read a book at the minimum, right? Or, or maybe play some piano or a pipe organ or something like that. Or I like model building, so I could build like a model or something like that. That's kind of like an activity. There's no stress, you know, there's no deadline. You're just doing it for fun for yourself. You know, there's no exterior, external expectation. So, and that certainly then helps me wind down. But yeah, it's a fairly, you know, like the day-to-day -day life is pretty. You know. mm. uh, and then it's punctuated by interesting things. I mean, I go to conferences and I meet new people and, and get to talk to sort of very interesting people. And I do these races, some of which are pretty crazy, and the majority of which are not so crazy because you know you can't do that stuff like you know all the time. So there's all kinds of interesting variations. And as a scientist, you get to travel a lot around the world. And so even though Champaign-Urbana is a very nice little town, actually has good schools, the university is very good, so I actually love living here. Um, but even you know, if you want your fill of museums or interesting scenery or whatever, you know, I fly to places anywhere, China, Middle East, uh, you know, Europe, you know, Australia, you name it. I mean, I've been to all these places. Mm. And so then you get to see the world as a scientist. That's actually one of the nice perks is you get to travel and there's lots of international meetings. And, and so scientists do like to exchange ideas and, and go to meetings. And so you actually get to see a lot of the world uh, and, and, ex and have lots of interesting experiences. And that then makes it pretty easy for me to live a mm. pretty sedate routine on the day-to-day -day basis where I teach my class and you know, talk to my grad students and, and do those sort of things. Um, so uh, you know, that might not work for some people. Right? Some people maybe are even more thrill seekers that they need something like different every day. But I'm actually perfectly happy doing very similar things you right. know, for, you know, most of the week. But then once in a while, every week or so, or every other week, I travel somewhere or do something that's mm. really new and different. And that's kind of enough to give me my novelty, you know, uh, for the for the week. Hmm. So. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and you've done other things that are I just. I mean, and still, it still it it surprises me how much you seek this experience and, and you have that curiosity, like like childlike curiosity to just do these things, which is it's it, something as you know, still somewhat young to remember as mm -hmm. we That's right. As, as you we still, you, you're not far away from it. That's right. So you just need to maintain it. To maintain it, yeah. You just need and, to maintain and, it. And as I said, it requires even, I mean, for me, it requires conscious effort to some extent at this point because it's so easy to fill your life mm -hmm. with obligations. Right and, right. and they're good obligations, right? Most of those things that you're doing are good things that you should be doing. But at some point, you have to just say no and then just do something just because you want to do it. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you kind of have to make time for it. And, and like I do. Right. I mean, I you know probably reserve uh, like a full day a week, I would even say more than that, like I probably reserve one and a half days a week to just do something, whatever I like to do, whether it's some exercise that I want to do or, or something new I want to try out or you know, anything that's not the, not the routine. And most of those things, of course, I don't necessarily even do them again because I tried and it's like, yeah, that was okay, but I'm not like, you know, this doesn't blow me away, so I don't need to do that again. Um, but, but sometimes it's something that you discover and you're like, whoa, you know, this is really fun. You know, I, 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 I should look into that more. Right? So there you go, and <clears throat> back and forth. Uh, what advice would you give someone in high school, someone in, in college, mm -hmm. someone who is motivated, who's curious about how to live a, a life of curiosity, a life of discovery? What would you tell them? Yeah, all the things in summary that we talked about, right? Uh, be willing to make mistakes because it's going to happen. Uh, be willing to choose what you feel is right for you when you feel strongly about it, right? I mean, otherwise you might consult with friends, parents, and other peer pressures, right, that are acting on you. Uh, and, 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 and then have some patience because you're not going to get all the stuff that you want to work out to work out immediately. You mm. often will have to wait sometimes for, you know, sometimes it might be 
minutes of, of patience. Sometimes it might be decades of patience. Depends on the mm. thing that you're looking at. Like instant gratification is not <laughs> as good as it's still <laughs> made out to be. Uh, delayed gratification is way better <laughs> in the in the long term. Okay. So that would be it in a nutshell. You know, you've you've done many experiences and you've experienced many things and you've lived life to an extent fully. Would you agree with that? Yeah, but I think that's, you know, again, this hopefully will be true for most of us. Right. If we are in a privileged enough situation. That, you know, mm. I mean, there are a lot of people in the world who are not anywhere near as lucky as we are as far as where they live or where they've been born or what kind of an environment they find themselves in. And, and that's actually one of the sad things in the human condition. Um, Although I think it's, I'm an optimist, you know, I'm a kind of an eternal, I think it has actually improved. I mean, the average wealth actually on, on, of people in the world is actually much higher now than it was in the 60s. If you just look at objective measures of how people do. And so even though it's always easy to focus on, there are also people who do badly, right? Unlike us who are lucky. All in all, actually humans are trying to, I think, make things better for themselves and mm -hmm. are even to some decent extent exceeding. So I feel, Actually, I don't feel too cynical about this, even though there's plenty of bad places you can point to in the world. Mm. And then along with that, do you, have you found new meaning or what do you think is the meaning of all of this? I guess, I mean, yeah, you continue that's, it's, it's, you know, I mean, as you can tell probably from how I fairly quickly answer certain questions uh, about whatever, you know, uh, do you believe in free will or whatever, I've thought about <laughs> all of these subjects a lot. And, and some of these things, you know, they just have to come to you, like by epiphany. Uh, for example, my my sister is uh, uh, now quite religious, and she makes no makes no secret on it. So it's not like I'm hiding anything in the book. But uh, she was not always. She was like me, really much more of an a-religious, and you know, let's try to explain things by uh, quantum measurement mm. <laughs> and see where that where that gets us. But she actually literally had an epiphany one day and and felt there's you know. Like there is somebody there that that you know, has, you know well maybe not simulates the universe but you know right 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 and and she had that feeling all of a sudden and she still does and she knows she has it and she can't really explain to me why it was there mm -hmm. one day and not the day before so I think people come to realizations throughout their lives of things where you realize suddenly something uh, and and then you and you feel it's true. Uh, and it could go either way. I mean, people. I've, I know also people who have gone the opposite way. They were mm. quite religious, and then suddenly someday it fell from them, and they they are they are no longer, and they're missing it even if, in some cases. So it's it's quite interesting, uh, but I think it's very unpredictable. Like in the end, uh, I think we used that phrase or used it of you know it when it happens, right? I think that's the best I can say. There is you know that when when you know you know. Mm. <laughs> How would your perspective change? I mean, from what you said, you're probably not very religious, but how would your perspective change, your, your science, your work change if you one day had this epiphany of believing in God? I wouldn't goddess? be able to tell you, right? Because you know, if you had to guess. it's something, if, yeah. I, if I had to guess, um, I mean, it, it, to some extent, it would probably give me more comfort in some ways than I have right now, right? I mean, if I really believe that there is an entity out there that actually cares uh, about me specifically, uh, uh, that has like that gigantic wisdom and, and oversight and overview over everything. Uh, it would be pretty nice. Uh, uh, in, in fact, one of the reasons I, you know, I mentioned earlier in the discussion that I was at one point interested in becoming a uh, church organist, right? But church organists typically work in churches and they play for congregations. Right. And one of the reasons in the end I decided not to do that, besides the fact that the music students really were way <laughs> better at it than, than I was, was that. I really feel that if you're going to do that as a job and you're going to play for a congregation and for be, you really should be able to feel that exactly as well. And if you don't, then you're just playing the music, mm. you know, but you're not really feeling it. And that's why I felt that that was not the right place mm. uh, for me to go. So, so the answer to answer your question, you know, if I suddenly had that epiphany my sister had, maybe I would actually take a pipe organ <laughs> and go to church. Right? <laughs> Who knows? I mean, it's, but I can't. It's impossible to tell. Because these are like life-changing events, and you have few of them right in a lifetime, um, and it's very hard to predict how you are actually mm -hmm. going to respond to that, right? I mean, maybe I would do something totally different than what I kind of just made up, right? Who knows? It's that that serious business, and it's totally it's very difficult. To, it's unpredictable. <laughs> like you said, and that, that's like if, if there's one thing you're certain of, yeah. is that's the one thing. Unpredictability is the <laughs> one thing I am certain of. Yes. Like change is the only constant. So, yes, change is the only constant. It's the good old way of, mm -hmm. of, of saying it. And I think I have uh, enough of an understanding of, of like your 
quantum mechanics and classical mechanics and various other theories that are even at higher levels or even at you know, lower levels down, that, that's what gives me that confidence that that's probably true. Uh, I mean, again, not absolute certainty, but that's probably as close to anything that I am certain of. <laughs> so at the end of our conversations, mm -hmm. we have a section that we call overrated or underrated. Mm -hmm. So I give you a statement or a word and you, mm -hmm. you, you say underrated. Okay, underrated. just you know, let's play the game. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one, open source textbooks. Uh, as, you, as you can tell, in this university, for instance, a lot of things are not open source. You need to take a class, you need to be registered for this thing in order mm -hmm. to access it. Mm -hmm. uh, so open source textbooks, overrated underrated. or underrated? Oh, you want me to explain why? Yeah, a little, like, yeah. briefly. So I think textbooks are way too expensive mm. these days. And, and I mean, we're, we're talking about things that cost hundreds of dollars sometimes. Right. So actually, I've given them up in all my classes. Uh, so I, my foot is where my mouth is in this case. Uh, but actually, I'm also not happy with all the open source material that's available, although I've contributed it. There's something called LibreText, Libre where you put science text. So I am a contributor to that. Um, so that already tells you why I think it's important and it's underrated. But actually, for my classes I teach here, I actually write textbooks, literally like long textbooks mm -hmm. from scratch. And they're available online, and the students just get them for free. Uh, and so you don't have to write. And the, the bonus I get out of that is that the book is exactly how I want to teach. It, mm. it says only the things I want to say. It doesn't talk about stuff that I don't feel there's time for or superfluous. Uh, because that's what happened, right? A lot of textbooks also, one reason they're so expensive is they've grown and grown. Mm. <laughs> like, you know, physics or chemistry <laughs> textbooks, they're like hundreds or even a thousand pages almost. And nobody can in a semester work through something like that. And so like for my classes, I basically set myself a limit of 100 pages max, and often it's actually shorter, maybe 70 to 80 pages. Mm. And it has only the things in it that I think the students in that class would need to know. But they're not just lecture notes, they're really like a book with figures and typeset text and homework problems that are worked out and integrated in the text and the whole works. And so I think that's really actually something that's great. And, and we, it was impossible, you couldn't do it 50 years ago, because again, you needed to have publishers printing you know, but now I can publish books myself, right? mm. and it's very easy to just disp you know, disperse materials to anyone. And so I think the time has come, actually, for these sorts of things. Now, open doesn't necessarily mean, though, that it's just a free-for-all. Right? Uh, and things have to still be curated and should be done by experts, uh, because there's a real information or misinformation right. problem out there. And so there's a lot of stuff that floats around out there that is simply inaccurate. And, and experts know that it is. But there are users who don't and, and who are happy to just go to that source and then expound on it as though that were mm. like the, the ultimate. So there's also that danger, right? Open source has the danger of uh, being more susceptible to misinformation and things that are curated and you pay a price for them. So there's you know, downsides, but I think the downsides are solvable problems. And of course, people are thinking about these, like all of these social media places and, and open source publishers they're obviously thinking about the problems of how do we stem misinformation. And, and we're not very good at it yet because you know, these media are also relatively young, uh, but we're getting much better at it now. So hopefully we'll have this figured out before we do something really dumb hmm. because of misinformation. Um, all right, next one. Steven Wolfram and Cellular, cellular Automata, underrated or overrated? Um, I would say neither nor, so I'm sorry I'm going to punt on this one. And, and the reason that cellular automator theory is interesting stuff and it has its applications. And, and Steve Wolfram is a brilliant, you know, very smart uh, guy. Um, and well, I mean, yes, I mean, somehow that stuff got a lot of press at one point or another. And so I guess if you forced me, then maybe I would say overrated. But it's not because I think that cellular automator are not actually interesting simulation technology and, and that Stephen hasn't done uh, very nice stuff. I know quite a number of the people actually at Wolfram Research mm. for various reasons, including people who were like at the startup company level already with them when I was a right. grad student. They were grad students in there. Now. Um, so, so if you forced me to, I would say overrated, but, but not really like seriously, um, mm. just because maybe it's gotten some more press randomly somehow than some other. There are other things where I would definitely say, uh, you know, <laughs> overrated. Um, another one? Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, fa the famous uh, scientist and researcher, Nancy Macri. Mm -hmm. Overrated or underrated? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> underrated. <laughs> what do you expect me to say? <laughs> that was the phone interruption. Yeah. Tried to call me. Uh, 
Yeah, so, so my wife is basically a theoretical chemist and really also a theoretical physicist that studies quantum phenomena uh, and, and uh, is uh, much more expert in many ways, especially at quantum phenomena that involve large, complex interacting systems. And she develops sort of path integral technologies to study these kinds of things and really likes to develop methods that can do things that nobody else can even come close. Not something that improves things by a factor of three, but things that improve things by a factor of a thousand or 10 to the six or something like that. So it actually makes a real difference, not just an order of magnitude here or there, but the difference between you can't even think about it versus mm. you can actually do it. So, so, that's, this is, so I think this is really neat stuff. How do you guys meet? Uh, <coughs> so we met as graduate students at, at UC Berkeley. Um, I started the year before her, uh, and uh, uh, I, I think they probably do this year as well. But if you do pretty well as a TA, then they have like a TA training school where you become one of the trainers, and then they mm. have the first years come in and you tell them, you know, how do you, how do you best run discussion sections and, and teach. And so she was the first year grad student, and I was the second year, you know, who had done some TA in the semester before in freshman chemistry, and uh, and we got to talk about what interests us and. And she was like an expert in quantum mechanics even then. I mean, you know, like in a sense, again, if you have the vocation to become a faculty member at something, you probably actually know it even right. as a teenager kind of already, mm -hmm. right? And so it became clear that we both had been studying quantum mechanics since we were teenagers and da da da. And it's like, hey, you know, I like that girl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's what you know, got me hooked. <laughs> it was the quantum entanglement. It was quantum entanglement <laughs> in the two sense of the word. <laughs> Actually, in both sense, because there's also, of course, there really is quantum entanglement. Right. It will happen. You know, I mean, we're quantum entangled as well. But True. Let's just keep it at that, though. <laughs> OK. Have you guys ever done any like research projects together or anything? Yeah, like we're working on something uh, together right now that actually yeah. involves trying to do some simulations that we want to do that require more massive simulation technology that can actually do essentially infinite dimensional systems as part of our uh, what we need to simulate. And so Nancy and one of her students is actually working on developing that. Well, one of my students has worked out the sort of few body theory for the same thing. Mm. And, and, but that told us that we want to do the many body calculation. Of it. And so we're going to, you know, so that's we're working on that right now. Hopefully we'll have a paper out soon. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, you can have publications in the family. Why not? It was actually one of the things on my bucket list, so I, so I guess good. Want to <laughs> Last one, um, yeah. the Iron Man competition. Overrated. Mm. Yeah, vastly overrated. Really? Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, I'll give you the reason for it. So, Iron Man, like all, com and I wouldn't have said this thirty years ago. So, Iron Man, like anything that strikes it big makes a migration from, and it's like a sport in this case, from something that's pretty esoteric and, you know, like only a few people in the world can even do it. Mm. And like in early 1980s, there were these videos on television where people collapsed before the finish line had to crawl right. or whatever, right? But, uh, but actually people eventually figured out how to do this. And I finally got to a point where I was doing like 10 Ironmans a year and it became kind of almost like an exercise of just, you know, I'm doing one every two weeks, mm. check mark, you know. Da, da, da. I wasn't even waking up early in the morning worried anymore. You know, at one point I barely even made it to the start on time because I was like, oh, I need to wake up and I have to <laughs> do this. And so, uh, so Iron Man races are really not all that hard. I think anyone at this point can do it. And it changes with time. So it was hard in 1979. Right. right. But we have had a lot of experience and a lot of people have done them. And like 50,000 plus people a year do them actually. Right. And so anything that 50,000 people do a year can't be all that hard to do. Uh, and so, and I think so it's become vastly overrated at this point. Not because it was really, really difficult at one point when we were inexperienced, but we have that experience now. And so that's why I migrated to other races like DECA, which is like uh, a, a triathlon, but you have to swim 24 miles and bicycle mm. 1,100 miles and run 262 miles. So it's like doing 10 Ironmans in one piece. And that one, now we're back to there. It's just like, you know, 20 people in the world that can do it. And even those, they try it and half of them can't finish the race when they, every time that they try it. Uh, so now we're back again. But you know, probably in 30 years, the DECA will be overrated mm -hmm. <laughs> as well because people will have figured out how to survive that well and it will become a more routine you know, thing for people to do. So anything I would say that pretends not to be routine mm -hmm. but is actually routine is overrated. And Ironman certainly has gotten to that point. All right, if you, if you had to redesign these competitions, what would you? How would you re redesign them? Uh, make them rougher, tougher, <laughs> and you know, more obstacles and more of everything. Like an like Ironman. By the time I was done 
I got the feeling that a lot of competitors actually complain like, oh, it's too hot at this venue. And I have to actually go up a mountain at that one. And they actually canceled those Ironman. Really? They left the flat ones with nice smooth swims. You know, at the end, there were like competitions that are flat on the bike and the swim has a stream that goes in your direction. So you're in the current, right? And, and so I say, have it in the rugged mountains, make people swim against the stream, you know, upstream. With, and, with sharks you know, and... Like <laughs> sharks and yeah. hail coming down, whatever. That's what you need to do. Then it's back in business again or something. That's so no one can actually... Do. The true Iron Well, not nobody. I mean, somebody <laughs> needs to be able to do it. Right? Uh, like like the, the Barclay Marathon, right, is a, also one of those memes that's super well-known. But I would say it's not overrated despite getting a lot of press because, you know, anything that only... Uh, a handful of people have ever been able to finish in like 30 years of its existence is clearly something that pushes people to the limit. So, so th the bottom line is if only a few people can even succeed at doing it, even the ones that try, it's not overrated. But if like tens of thousands of people do it, you know, at some point it's definitely overrated if somebody still thinks that that's like some extraordinary thing that's tough to do. So it needs a refresh. It needs a refresh. And that's true for anything, mm. you, right? Eventually, even things, that, anything that used to, there's lots of things, right, that used to be hard 50 years ago, but they're actually quite easy right. to do now. And then, and then we do something else instead of make it more difficult in some other way. Right? Therefore, a minute mile. I mean, it, it, yeah. was, it was impossible until it wasn't, and then people just played it Absolutely, Exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, the marathon was at one point like the, the epitome of running. In fact, mm. it was very sexist in its early years because people thought that like women can't run marathons or stuff like that. Right? So they would bar them from running. But of course, women can perfectly well run marathons and actually have excellent endurance. And so, but, but and it's changed. But nowadays, again, there's like hundreds of thousands of people a year that run marathons. And so, you know, I, I think anyone can run a marathon if they listen to some advice and do a bit of training. Um, and no, not anyone can run it in two hours. That's a <laughs> that's a different ball. Not anyone can do an Ironman in seven hours and forty five minutes yeah, either, right? And then we're talking world class. But that's we're not talking about that. We're talking about is it hype because you can do it and the right. answer is yes, anyone can do it and therefore it's hyped in that sense. Mm. All right. I think that would be a good place to end. So okay, sounds good. Thank you so much for, yeah. for coming. Thanks for having me out. <laughs> One more sip. <laughs> Perfect. And thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the conversation about making mistakes, if you live in a simulation or not, um, the perception of time, living a healthy lifestyle, all these, all these little things that together make a full, very fulfilled life, right? Um, we have a very good example sitting in front of us who has possibly done everything and probably there's still more things that uh, he would like to do. And, I think what gets the person going is that innate sense of curiosity and that willingness to keep trying and to not be demotivated by your failures. Mm -hmm. um, that's a skill that you can only fully adapt to or like accept once you experience it. And I think there will be hardships in the way. As you mentioned, he also faced a lot of peer pressure or there can be many setbacks, but keeping your target focused and just having the will to keep moving forward is it's what matters at the end of the day. So I would like to thank you once again for sharing all your stories, experiences, and these amazing bits of wisdom with us. Thanks, and as you said, if you know it, you know it. If you know <laughs> it, you know it, exactly. And don't be afraid to make mistakes, stay curious. This is the UFC Talk Show, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Um.